signed. <laughs> Committee Room 21. Okay. We are now um, open to the um, public. Welcome everyone to the 22nd meeting of the Committee of Finance in the 22 to 27 mandate. Uh, members, this will be broadcast. The committee is going to be broadcast live online and throughout Parliament buildings. Um, please, uh, if you are using a phone, either put it in silent or airplane mode. Um, we have a number of members joining us on Zoom today. Um, obviously, they should indicate to the clerk or myself, should they wish to ask a question at any point or make a comment. The next agenda item is declaration of interests. Members are obliged to declare any interests at this stage or as we move through the agenda. Does anyone have an interest they wish to declare? Okay. Agenda item three is chairperson's business. The first item of chairperson's business is um, the, from the Department, it is Public Income and Expenditure, uh, Account 2324. So, members, if you turn to page six of the meeting pack, this is the mechanism under which the consolidated fund is operated and it is governed by um, the Government Resources and Accounts Act NI 2021, or Granny, if you are a nerd. Mm -hmm. um, as members are aware, the fund is the executive's current account operating on a receipts and payments basis. All payments out of the fund need legislative authority and may be charged to it directly by statute, known as standing services, or voted by the Assembly each year in the Budget Acts, known as supply services. Government accounts within the department, excuse me, government, government accounts branch within the department is responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the fund with all payments subject to the authorization of the C and A G. That doesn't mean individual payments obviously go to the Controller and Auditor General, but they have yes, the audited. Yeah. Um, at page 10 of the meeting pack, members will see examples of what the fund comprises. There is a useful diagram, this is page 12 and page 13. Uh, the CNAG has indicated that she has no observations to make on the report. We did actually discuss some of this with the Treasury Officer of Accounts um, earlier this year, and we got a briefing on, on that. If people um, uh, wish to go back and look at that evidence, uh, we went through some of that in detail, and they sent, up, they sent us follow-up information as well on things like how interest is earned on um, or not earned on money that, that is held. So it's just a note, unless there's any comments. The next item is uh, urgent oral statement. Um, there's also an urgent, uh, there's also a written statement, which we will come to in a little bit. Um, in fact, I might just take the two of them together because well, it's easiest, it makes yeah. sense. Um, the urgent oral statement is on the pausing and city and growth deals. So that's at page three uh, and page nine of the table pack. It was also emailed to fr members on Friday. Uh, that is the the um, the, uh, the the pausing of the city and growth deals. You will also find members in your pack. Um, uh, um, so I, I should say that Joanne McBurney, who's going to give us evidence in a little bit, will obviously be able to give us, I think, some outline information. She isn't responsible, I should say, for the administration of um, city and growth deals uh, or the disbursement of the money, but as we know, she is, um, after the Permanent Secretary, the most senior official responsible for day-to-day -day budget matters and large negotiation and engagement with the Treasury. So she will hopefully, I'm sure, be able to give us a general sense of the discussions. But if you go to item 3.5, um, which came in just today because we only got the WMS in the last couple of hours um, on on the same subject city and region deals the um, the minister has um, <clears throat> excuse me uh, confirmed that following her conversations with the treasury the chief secretary of the treasury um, that uh, that the pause on the the other deals so obviously um, uh, with Derry and Straban the signing is proceeding and uh, Belfast is untouched, we are assured, or it's unchanged. Um, uh, the other two, Causeway Coast and Glens and Mid Ulster and South, um, uh, the pause remains on that. Um, uh, so uh, the Minister says mem or suggests members or, uh, raise the issue of the Chief Secretary of the Treasury. I think there's broad, I don't want to make presumptions. Uh, cross-party support for the position that this should not be the case. I don't think anyone thinks this is a legitimate um, uh, pausing. Um, so um, uh, I would, uh, a piece of information that would be useful, and I will bring members in, obviously people want to have their say on this, and um, it would be useful to get a sense of where the other two city deals are, actually, if the department's able to give us a sense of that, I think it's useful information because it would be helpful to know what exactly 
what live risks to, I think, better enable all of us as representatives, including on this committee, to make these arguments. I think it would be helpful to know um, what live pressures are being created. We knew there was a signing that was going to happen in Derry. We knew lots of the stuff, including on a commercial basis, is well advanced, and that's also the case um, uh, in, with, with the Belfast region deal. I can obviously think about the glider extension in my own constituency, but it would be helpful to know where some of those things are. I think a bit less progressed, but that doesn't mean they aren't they wouldn't be severely damaged by a delay. So, um, sure, if, if we can get yes. agreement now, it might be useful. I, I, we, we did look at trying to bring in um, the official with detail today, but she's with the minister and working on this issue, so it just wasn't going to be possible. But if members are in agreement, Chair, if you're, if you're happy enough, we'll seek to get um, Gillian in as soon as possible yeah. to give that specific brief. That would be helpful. Okay, people are happy you. enough for that. Um, um, so, uh, members, I think I, I would be content if others are that we write to the... Um, minister and confirm uh, the committee's broad support for the position of unpausing that. I'm, I'm happy to bring in members. Um, the, the vice chair, I think, want to come in first, and then Stevie Aiken. <coughs> yeah, thank you very much, um, and support you right now off to get a bit more information and clarity on this terrible treatment of our um, city and growth deals. Um, my question t- would be to we need clarity on what the difference is in them all. Like, why was such a difference made? Um, in two versus two because I know that across them all there are different parts of them that are well progressed and I had asked it um, in the chamber and the minister answered broadly but I know that whenever this came through on um, Friday evening um, where I was at there were some um, of my local council officials you know around me and and the panic that it caused and the stress um, I just you know happened to be um, near a whole lot of people who were very invested at that particular point in time as to what that meant for them. So the stress that it placed on everyone over those 24 hours was, was terrible. And our local councillors thinking how they were going to answer to, to ratepayers and what they spent on the, the back of it. So I had asked the Minister um, to outline what had been spent to date. But I would ask that in terms of the Department of Finance and the central oversight role, that that's is visit it with the partners. Because I think this snap, knee-jerk, unexpected announcement is maybe a good time for people to reflect so that all of our local councils and partners could set forward, here's everything that we have spent to date, here's everything we're committed to, here's the contracts we can or can't get out of, because you know, if, if we're going to move forward, we need to fully appreciate what it means for, for each of these partners, just in case when the Labour government are looking at it, they just do not fully appreciate the gravity of what's been bought in by so many partners. Agreed. Uh, Steve Aiken. Steve Aiken, can you hear us? I should also say, members, the, uh, uh, in addition to writing to the fi- oh, oh, there is, Finance Committee, I was going to suggest that we write to the CST to, to, to confirm that we are not in agreement with pausing the two, so people are agreed with that. We can, we can do that. Sorry, Steve, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay. Sorry, the, the, link's not, the, link, the link's not very strong. Apologies. Sure. Uh, just a quick one. Uh, I fully agree with what uh, yourself and indeed the uh, Deputy Chair has said. I mean, the degree of uncertainty is significant. However, one of the other issues I have concerns with now is that our entire budget has been based on, I think, as the Finance Minister has said, uh, that she is taking on risk the uh, Barnett consequentials and the fundings that are likely to come across. I think we probably need to have some degree of certainty of where those monies are coming from as well as around the city deals, because I think this could uh, completely uh, unravel a lot of the assumptions we're trying to make going forward. Uh, It's a fair point. I would say a couple of things. Number one, I think um, we have one of the better people, the best people to ask about that is giving giving us evidence in a little while is Joanne McBurney, so we can clarify that with her. I also think my assumption would be um, this sounds like it was a monumental cock up by the Treasury combined with the NIO, uh, as well as being profoundly unacceptable. Um, uh, but it's also the case that I think it's probably, uh, I would hope, but I want to ask this with Joanne McBurney, this is relates to specific types of capital expenditure, i.e. rather than resource spending. So I think some of what you're saying, Steve, is are, are, we, you know, are we making inappropriate uh, is now the executive making un- unsafe assumptions about resource spending and its resource budget? Um, I, I, I think we need to find that out. But I, I, I doubt it. I assume this relates to specific types of 
committed but not allocated or um, uh, capital expenditure or allocated but not committed. I'm not sure which. Paul Free. Yeah, just just to echo every, what everyone says, it's really concerning um, because there doesn't seem to be any sort of impact assessment done here. And I suppose we're only uh, a couple of weeks into this Labour government, and we're already seeing that they make decisions without impact assessments being conducted. So I don't think we can assume anything from this Labour government and the decisions that they'll make, especially in this first year of their mandate. Uh, I think they're going to be making a lot of decisions around this uh, financial. They're going to just try and grab money. Um, I suspect the reason why um, some of my constituents in North Antrim are progressing with city deals and the other half of my constituency is not is simply because of the progress that has been made and the contractual commitments. And I suspect if the Labour government had have, uh, pursued uh, stopping or pausing all four, then they would have been in court. Uh, and I think they've weighed up that situation more so than any impact assessment that it has on people. Uh, so I think this is a dastardly decision uh, because most foremost they have reneged on promises, uh, financial promises, uh, and that's not on. So I don't think the Department of Finance should presume or assume anything with regards to any budget settlement in the coming years. Okay. Um Nicola Brogan. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, listen, I just want to come in and suppose to voice my opposition to this here on behalf of the Mid South West um, deal. Be the Fermanagh and Oma Council are obviously involved heavily in that there. And it does feel like, yet again, I know plenty of people involved in it will feel that, again, rural areas are being neglected and being um, left on the, on the back foot. Um, and I suppose even going by the written ministerial statement there that we received, we will feel that the British government is operating a two-tier system there where it's one rule for um, cities and, and the fact they got their city deals and then the rural areas have been neglected again. Um, so uh, what I wanted to ask, Chair, but I think you said this there, was that maybe that the committee could um, you know, make it very clear that we are um, against these the four deals being or these two deals being paused. Um, but I think you did say that you were yes. willing to read to the. I think uh, we should definitely do that. Secretary of State and the what is the Secretary uh, of the Treasury. I think Secretary we should. I think we should write Treasury. to both. Yeah, I think you're. I, yeah. think, I think writing to both is, is a good idea. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, and Tamison. Thank you, Chair. It's just coming back to the point as to whether this is cock up or conspiracy. If it is cock up, why haven't the decisions on the other two deals been reversed? And that, that's my major concern. The only rationale that anyone can see for a pause on funding is if you're intending to cut or reprofile that funding. And I think that is enormously concerning. I think Paul's right when he says that this seems to be purely a decision around progress and contractual arrangements. That's not good enough. I mean, like Nicola, I'm based in the Mid South West region. Um, I know that they are hoping to progress to heads of terms in the autumn. How can they possibly do that now with uncertainty around the funding that's going to be available to them? How can they scope projects, prioritise projects if they don't know what they're dealing with? So it has thrown all of that into disarray. So it's having a huge impact irrespective um, of the, the progress that has been made. And I think we need to reiterate that point. Um, but it's not just the trust and confidence, as others have said, that has been broken down between the executive and the UK government. The whole point of these city deals is about leveraging private sector investment. And how are we going to do that now when there is so little confidence um, in the UK government's ability to uphold previous commitments? Um, so I think we need to be absolutely united and fairly robust um, with the UK government on this issue because I think their behaviour has been utterly deplorable. I agree, and I don't think there's any, um, I don't think there's any disagreement. Uh, uh, I think it's important that we make those um, points. Sorry, Philip Brett. Thank you, Chair, and I wholeheartedly agree with the, the points that, that members have made, and I think taking this up directly with UKG from the, the committee is welcome, but it was just the point that I made at question time to, or, or to the statement that the Finance Minister made, that it wasn't just city deals that has been paused by uh, the government uh, levelling up, there's only one project in phase three of levelling up, that was here in Northern Ireland and that was Crusaders Football Club, uh, Shore Road Skills Centre, two and a half million pounds, it was announced in the last budget. Uh, the club has raised the 10% contribution required and ready to go to contract and receive correspondence 
just say that this has also been paused. So I was just to ask it if we are making representations um, on pausing and funding for city deals that we could also include that project under levelling up that was also paused at the same time. I think that's fine. I, I, I'm more than happy to an associated level. I think that's reasonable, yeah. Given it's the same, um, it is a promise that has been made and then unmade, and even if it's a, a pause rather than a cancellation. Okay. People are content. Um, we will move on to the next uh, item, which is actually I need to go back to 3.4, which is <clears throat> excuse me, uh, commissioning and budget scrutiny. Members have previously discussed the importance of budget scrutiny by other committees, and this scrutiny and that this scrutiny may be hamper hampered by a lack of information from their respective departments. Members will be aware that the Department of Finance regularly commissions information from other departments throughout the year. E.g., uh, for example, the, ur the urgent information gathering exercise over the summer recess and monitoring rounds. Quite often this committee, and indeed other committees, may not hear of these exercises until after returns have been submitted or later. I would suggest that we request the Department informs this committee as a matter of course when returns have been uh, commissioned and we can then choose to choose, uh, or we, think we then could circulate um, to other committees with a view to them. Uh, getting other uh, appropriate information from their departments, if people are content with that as a proposal. Thank you. Great. Okay. We now move on to uh, draft minutes of the last meeting. Members of page 38 of the meeting pack and 12 of the tabled pack. You will see um, uh, um, uh, minutes. There's a, The minutes in the table pack are slightly updated because of a typographical error. Uh, but if you are content, um, I will sign those um, that's the meeting on the 11th of September, and if people are content, I'll sign the minutes. Thank you. Thank Great. You. Okay. Um, agenda item five is matters arising. Um, if you look at the um, uh, page 54 of uh, the meeting pack, um, you will see um, the, um, uh, the, exec the TO, Executive Office Committee, has written to this committee asking for a response to the draft PFG document by the 18th of October, members will recall that at last week's meeting, we agreed to seek a briefing from the Department of Finance on the draft PFG to cover wider Department of Finance uh, responsibility uh, matter, resp res DOF responsibilities, and other relevant issues. During last week's meeting, members discussed the lack of connection between budgets and the PFG, which makes it more difficult for committees to scrutinise the work of departments and other bodies with respect to the programme. The committee agreed to write to other statutory bodies to encourage them to seek briefings on how departments' responsibilities in the PFG are linked to specific budgets. We have asked for any responses linking the PFG to budgets to assist with our overarching budget scrutiny. And I would just re-emphasise that point. I think that this is going to be a completely critical part of what we as a committee do in the next two and a half, two and th two thirds years is um, challenge and scrutinise to ensure that budgets are properly aligned to the outcomes in the programme for government or, he says, somewhat politically, lack of outcomes. Um, but anyway, that would be my opinion. So members, if people are content, we will note that correspondence pending our departmental briefing on the PFG. Okay. So uh, the next item is the Scottish programme for government in 24-25. Uh, so members, at page 56 of the meeting pack, you will see um, the Scottish model for the programme for uh, government, and it was suggested that it would be included in today's PAC. Members um, will note the, um, uh, the, the, the detail it contains on budgets, uh, as well as an updated four-year legislative programme. Um, I would remark, without making any political endorsement of any uh, particular other government, that it is um, pretty precise in some ways, and it has fairly precise uh, numbers and targets. Um, uh, and I would um, draw a fairly obvious comparison, and not a particularly uh, positive one, but that's me speaking politically rather than as chair. Um, but I do think it's interesting, not, nevertheless. Um, it's quite a user-friendly way that it's laid out, and obviously um, uh, it is useful for comparison purposes, um, but that's really for noting, unless any member wants to comment on it. Just make the point, you know, it's good that they have targets, but if we look at how many of those targets they met from their last programme for government, that will probably make interesting comparison to ours, but as you say, those are political points, Matthew. That Absolutely. We're all, we're, we're, it is perfectly in order for people to make political points. We've all, everything we do are, are political yes. points because we're politicians. And uh, the only point I would make, obviously, is that 
you're able to judge them by that. You've just demonstrated the, the efficacy of having targets because you're able to, because you're able to exercise a judgment. So <laughs> I, I would simply say you've proven my point. Um, but anyway, um, okay. Um, anybody else wish to comment? Otherwise, we'll move on. The next item is something came up in last week's meeting, which is draft correspondence regarding the um, Apple uh, taxes settlement uh, in the South. At last week's meeting under AOB, we discussed issuing committee correspondence in relation to the European Court of Justice decision regarding Apple's payment to uh, the Irish government um, uh, or their their owing to the Irish government, uh, 13 billion, I'm not sure it's been remitted yet, um, in unpaid taxes. Uh, now, we suggested, um, uh, after discussion, we suggested the draft letters would be um, um, uh, the draft letters would be prepared by the clerk um, for consideration at today's meeting. So um, uh, um, we, we give some feedback. I've um, given my, some of my own feedback already. So we have tweaked letters, first of all, to um, uh, our uh, minister uh, um, up here and also to Jack Chambers, the Minister for Finance in Dublin. Um, do member so the uh, what we had agreed is that we would seek to add, make factual uh, ask for factual information regarding the process by which this money may be um, transferred or remitted um, uh, so that would uh, enable us to do our job in terms of scrutiny um, but I'm happy to take comments the deputy chair I don't really feel that the draft of letters are reflective of what was discussed at the meeting. Okay. Um, whenever it was raised, I just made the point that I thought that we should ask our finance minister, has she considered it, and, and take it forward from there. So I just feel like the letters are saying that we're you know, asking her to do something and we're forming an opinion for her, whereas I felt that... Um, our position as committee was to ask her, has she done anything or would she be considering doing anything? And I wouldn't um, think that until she came back we should be setting anything further to um, the Irish government. And that's just my feedback. That's what I, my understanding of was what was okay. last week's meeting. We, we, is your view then, so I'm understanding that we shouldn't be at, first of all, that we should write initially to the, um, to the Devolta Keeve Archibald, the and I, finance minister, for her views. Then, pending her response, we should hold back. That's 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 the your your perspective. Um. Yeah, chair. Just um. Just to ask her, has she done anything? Yeah. Because she may have, as we've discussed at this committee before. Sometimes, you know, she's had meetings and done a few things. So rather than us um taking steps or suggesting what she should be doing, I just felt that the first step should be for us to ask the minister. Has she done anything so okay. far? Sure. Um, I'm going to well. bring in Jerry Carl. Anybody else who wishes to come in as well? I want to get every, anybody who wants to comment should have the opportunity. Jerry Carl. Yeah, sure. So I'd say bad signal here as well. So the camera's off. Um, but yeah, no, I'm happy with the, the proposed letter and how it looks. I think it's important that we raise many things with the minister, officials about issues that have been raised or haven't been raised. Um, uh, it's fair enough to ask for further clarity, as the deputy chair said, but I think given the scale of the finance that we're talking about, given the scale of the, the previous discussion and discussion all this week instalment about lack of finance and funding of public services being at a at a pretty uh, dangerous point, um, I think it's only right that the finance committee should raise it with the finance minister to encourage her to, to raise it with her um, counterparts in the survey. So I, I'm happy with the letter as is. Okay. Um, Paul, sorry, Owen Tennyson first and then Paul. Did you want to Chair, just say, look, I'm I'm content with the letters as, as proposed as well. It is unconventional. I mean, I take the, the Deputy Chair's point, it's unconventional for this committee to write to the Irish yes. Finance Minister, but this is a fairly unconventional ruling. Yeah. Um, and I suspect we won't be the only group or body um, no, writing to the Irish Finance Minister advocating for our own cause, so I, I, I think it's it's fair enough. Paul, for you. I just worry about cross jurisdictional protocols around this stuff. There's protocols around a committee writing to another committee in this place or writing to another department a minister in this place. So I just worry about the protocols and setting precedents that maybe we can't get back in the box. But also, um, you wouldn't want to undermine any work that the executive is doing in this regard. I'm happy to undermine the executive. My joke said, that's me joking. That's <laughs> no, me because it would benefit us. So if there is work in progress joke, through the various the guises record. of uh, connections between the two jurisdictions, yeah. uh, a size nine from the Finance Committee here might not be the 
nicest thing uh, to go into that negotiation. So I would just worry about that. There's no doubt about it. It is unique. Um, Ireland has all these data centres down south which is sucking energy out of our grid, which we share. So there is an interest here. But uh, I just worry about the protocol and the size nine from the committee. Actually, we're size 11, so... But, 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 yeah. Does anybody else wish to come <laughs> okay. in? I have understood it. You, uh, before I come, does anybody else wish to come I've understood it, your presence. Okay. In, in that instance, can I suggest, I think it would be perfectly in order, though, yes, unconventional, but can I suggest in order that we move forward with a degree of consensus, I think where we can have, obviously sometimes we won't have consensus that, that we do write initially to the financement, to, but with a view to then taking a view about whether we follow it up after that with um, with her counterpart in Dublin. So I think if people are content with the broad wording that we have to the first letter pending the, um, so that's the, the uh, feedback from the deputy chair that we will write, um, and then we once we have a response, Deirdre Hargy wants to come in, Deirdre? Yeah. No, sorry, I was just going to say I'm content with that approach then to try and find that consensus, Matthew, that we read initially to our finance minister, yeah. see the update, and then if there's further actions with Jack Chambers, then we should do that as well. Okay, good. I'm glad we've been able to get some consensus. We'll, we'll write first to the to 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 Kiva, to the to the NI minister, and then we will, we will go from there once we have a response. Okay, thank you. Um, if people are content, everybody's um, had their spate. The next item is 5.5, .5, which is the September update on the interim PSTB. So members, at page 30 of the table pack, we have an oral briefing. Sorry, page 30 of the table, we, we have um, scheduled an oral briefing for next uh, week, but we, there is an update um, on the work of the Public Sector Transformation Board. Um, the department has indicated that the chair of the interim board um, wrote to the Minister for, of Finance on the 9th of September detailing the transformation proposals um, selected by the interim PSTB um, uh, to move forward to the next stage, as well as proposals to be included in a digital landscape review. Um, I'm not quite sure what a digital landscape review is, but um, we're going to maybe ask that question next week. Um, and proposals not moving to the next stage. In total, 29 proposals or continue to move forward. If I'm right from what the Minister said today, there were 47 proposals, yeah. proposals or bids. It's 29 are moving forward, 18 of which are categorised as digital and included within the digital landscape review, and a further 11 that are moving to a stage two assessment. Full details are outlined in the correspondence, um, as I say, that is at page 30. So you will see some of the um, some discussions, I suppose, um, a, a question that I have is, and have had, is whether um, these, all, these these are all simply projects that were happening anyway, and they are bidding in for extra money. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because if they've pr a proven track record of delivering better services and savings, by all means, they should be continued with. But um, I think that'll be a question for us to ask. Um, does any member wish to make any comments? I will go to Steve Aiken and then Philip Brett. Steve? Yeah, thank, th thanks, Chair. Uh, just a quick one. Uh, just looking at the sort of the Digital Transformation Fund and the rest of it, we're already sort of halfway through the year and there seems to be a bit of a delay in getting some of these out. And I appreciate the ones that are going, as, as I'm trying to understand it, the first set have gone through, that's ongoing, but the second set that's coming through, they all seem to be very sort of, you know, when it says digital transformation, everything seems to be based around sort of computer programs and sort of uh, software updates and the rest of it. Just like a degree of clarity, uh, if possible, um, if we could about what these actual programs are and maybe somebody could translate it into English, please. Well, I'm not meant to too much to ask, but can I can I suggest that we'll have a, in a week or two's time next week we're ha we're getting an update, so we we can ask. I suppose the, your ask is that where possible we have a slightly more um, plain English version of what each of these projects is doing. So, for example, um, where it comes to I mean I don't want to pick on uh, the digital and data optimization, data analytics and science hub, and. Um, we all should be able to, I think, given our jobs, have a relative, relatively educated guess about what kind of thing that would be doing in DERA. But um, I think what you're asking for, Steve, is a kind of where we can, a line or two of plain English explanation. I don't really want us to give uh, an official days and days of work, but if we could have someone 
explain in a line yeah. or two or a short paragraph what each of these is that what you're saying yeah what the that's, purpose of these that, that's what I'm, that's what i'm that's what i'm doing look one of the issues we're having sort of chair yeah. is that a lot already. of these programs are we've we've had significant program problems before with digital transformation programs uh, indeed amongst this committee we've seen various things and things have gone wrong and the rest of it but it, it might be useful for if we if we have an understanding of actually what they're trying to achieve and i think that would be a briefing would be suitable although i would just say i don't think what we probably don't want to get go get into the rabbit hole of is us second guessing the the smart bus project or the flood forecasting center because that's the job of the other committee to say whether that's value for money or the or the right thing i think we we're, we're slightly more overarching but 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 point taken philip uh, brett point that i was making chair and it's just when the officials do come if they could give us some idea of the the value of each project yes. one may be vastly different from from the other as you say chair apart from the dof one i don't think it's our role to interrogate the merits or demerits of individual projects but it would yeah. just be useful to know the value that each have bid, bid for into this board yeah. chair what, yes. what we may well do if members are in agreement is simply ask when the officials come that we, we have the briefing paper we get sets out the detail that yeah. members have already outlined and i would suggest that then members might want to send that on to the other committees because they may well have had no detail at all on this exactly. i think that's really good i think that's a really good action yeah because a lot of them will will for the first time be seeing a big thumbs up there from dr aiken i think that is a suggestion that we should all um i think that would be useful okay if people are content we will move on next agenda item is registration of deaths and stillbirths uh written briefing so members of page 104 of the meeting pack um uh yes we're going to the closed session um uh Committee Room 21, signed. <phone rings> Committee Room 21, signed. <phone rings> Committee Room 21, signed. Committee Room 21, signed. <phone rings> Committee Room 21, signed. <phone rings> Committee Room 21, signed. Committee Room 21, signed. <phone rings> Committee Room 21, signed. <phone rings> Committee Room 21, signed. Committee Room 21, signed. <phone rings> Committee Room 21, signed. <phone rings> Committee Room 21, signed. Committee Room 21, signed. <phone rings> Committee Room 21, signed. <phone rings> Committee Room 21, signed.
Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. (laughs) 
Committee Room 21. Signed. 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 Committee Room 21. Signed.
Committee Room 21. Signed. <coughs> Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. <coughs> Committee Room 21. Signed. <coughs> Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. <coughs> Committee Room 21. Signed. <coughs> Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. <coughs> Committee Room 21. Signed. <coughs> Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. <coughs> Committee Room 21. Signed. <coughs> Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. <coughs> Committee Room 21. Signed. <coughs> Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. <coughs> Committee Room 21. Signed. <coughs> Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. <coughs> Committee Room 21. Signed. <coughs> Committee Room 21. Signed. Committee Room 21. Signed. (coughs) 
Committee Room 21. Signed. 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 Just put that on the record. I always want to say to him, remember Little Britain, whenever he says, you're back in the room. Back in the room. <laughs> 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 Cancelled now, so I shouldn't be talking referring to it a little bit. Now. It's still on the iPlayer, though. Is it? Deleted scene. <coughs> it's got trigger warnings on it. We're just waiting now for confirmation from. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so chair, if if members are content, I'll just very quickly summarise um, what's coming out of of that closed session. So, if members are content, we will write to the department to seek clarification on what is possible around the existing um, deaths and stillbirths bill that is, is still in draft in terms of what options there would be around a UK government bill being taken forward, if that's being thought about, if we have any detail on that, around the potential for retitling the bill to widen out its scope to allow a clause to be inserted around baby loss certificates, or whether the existing drafting might just be able to accommodate that. And any further detail they can give us on any discussions they've had with health around logistics and resource okay. and any time scales they think that they can realistically give us on those particular options. Okay. Um, members are content, sure, we go ahead and do that. Okay. Thank you. Content? Great. Thank you, folks. So the next uh, agenda item is um, okay. seven, and we it is an oral briefing from the department on um, uh, the financial provisions bill. If people are content, uh, we will. Uh, the Hansard will report on this. It's pre-legislative scrutiny, uh, so we have Hansard here. Uh, members, if you turn to page one one three of your pack, you will find a written briefing on the financial provisions bill. So, members, we have officials here today. Um, so, uh, welcome Patrick Neeson, um, uh, Ian Fleming and Sarah Gibson, who are all from the Supply Division in the Department and um, uh, have been working on this um, bill. They are here to brief us on uh, and give us uh, and answer our questions on the Financial Provisions Bill. People will previously have seen correspondence from the Department uh, and regard, uh, it, with regard to this bill um, and obviously it, re it re relates to a number of legislative changes the department re departments require for routine financial matters for which it would not be practical to have specific legislation. The attached briefing indicates that there is much more substance to this bill than acting on the black box. The black box, for those who um, wish to be reminded, is um, spending that is categorised as coming under the sole authority of the Budget Act. So um, it is something that causes, I've forgotten the quite, the, the there's a lot, uh, uh, We've got to the stage now where there's a very large volume of spending under 
um, under what's called the black box, the sole authority of the Budget Act, and it includes things like welfare mitigations. I think welfare mitigations is the single biggest item, um, uh, and uh, it's effectively where spending doesn't is not. There hasn't been a, sp a specific legislative provision for it elsewhere, so it is covered under sole authority of the Budget Act. The financial provisions. One of the things the financial provisions bill does is to tidy up items that do not have their own legislative provision. <laughs> But it's not just about that. Um, of the 16 provisions, um, uh, three belong to the Department of Finance, who so we'll ask about the bill more generally, but it also does include um, the, uh, the investment fund. So obviously the black box spending relates to lots of departments, but we have a particular interest in it because of our budget scrutiny. Um, but specifically relating to the department are uh, the NI investment fund, which I think was created in 2017 and is the thing that funds not just hotels, but a lot of hotels. Um, uh, the appointment of the uh, Northern Ireland Audit Office external editor, uh, auditor, sorry, um, uh, and an increased limit on consolidated fund advances. Um, so the other 13 provisions cover other departments and members will be seeking the views of other committees in due course. So welcome again, Patrick, Sarah, and Ian. Um, uh, and members are going to uh, to ask um, uh, ask questions. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you want to give us a quick. Uh, if a quick opening statement or insight. You don't have to, but but if there is one you want to give us, I'll speak very quickly. You sure. Cover lots of lots of things. I was going to kind of say anyway, but yeah. I'll just I'll, I'll give a yeah. bit of background maybe. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to come along today. So as you've said, financial provisions bills are there to deal with, or to be brought in regular kind of semi regular intervals to deal with financial matters that don't warrant their own individual legislation. So. The last one was in 2014, the one before that was 2009. We probably would have done one in the intervening period, but obviously just because the Assembly wasn't functioning, yeah. we weren't able to do one and that delayed things. So in January this year, we wrote out two departments to ask them were there any provisions that they wanted contained within the Financial Provisions Bill. Six departments have identified um, matters that they wanted addressed, uh, agriculture, communities, economy, infrastructure, TO and ourselves. As you said, there's 16 provisions then in the draft <coughs> legislation, or what will be draft legislation. So, um, so following that engagement with departments, um, Minister with the Executive colleagues in June to get their agreement around what would be included within the Financial Provisions Bill, and that was secured in, in, in June this year. I think we wrote to the committee at that stage to make you aware of it. So since then, we've been engaging with colleagues and the other departments involved and an OLC, just in terms of getting drafting instructions to OLC so they can begin that process of drafting the legislation. So that's been ongoing over the summer. Um, and yes, I, I provided you with the briefing paper just to set out all the proposed uh, legislative provisions. Um, as you'd said, there's, there's a wide range of those. Uh, I can give you a quick resume of, of those. Um, as you've said, some of them deal with sole authority issues, some aren't. Yeah. Um, so you have the briefing paper. I can mm -hmm. quickly go down if you want to give a quick summary of them or else just happy to stop at this stage and just deal with questions. So there's um, 16, uh, 16, 16 provisions um, uh, which people have there and they're helpfully in the briefing pack. Um, I suppose, um, and thank you very much, I suppose uh, a few initial questions from myself. Um, what first of all, when is the bill going to be introduced? Well, we're dealing with uh, OLC, so we have been over the summer uh, liaising with departmental colleagues and other departments to get those draft instructions. So there's a we have been, I suppose, going through that process over the summer. We've been mm -hmm. trying to coordinate that, coordinate that in, 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 in DOF. So I think there's been good progress made over the summer in terms of getting those draft instructions to OLC. OLC, to be fair, have been good in trying to turn those into a piece of legislation. They'll want matters um, clarified and so on, so there's been a little bit of back and forward. So I guess in answer to your question, we don't know yet, but I think we've made good progress in getting to a point where we have draft legislation to, in order to take it forward then to, to be introduced. So we're not, we're not quite there yet. Not there. Is there a draft bill? or are they Not still yet. Not, not yet. yet. So are you, would you be confident that it'll be introduced this year? I think we're, I mean, we're hopeful. It, I mean, it depends on others. It depends on how quickly, um, you know, the, the departments can do those draft instructions, deal with any queries of OLC, and OLC can turn it into draft legislation, bring it together. In one You've got the other departments have to, they, it's not just one department dealing with it. You have to deal with officials in DERA or DERA, because they're... Exactly. So, it's, they can, so I think, I mean, 
there's been good collaboration with with officials. You know, nobody's you know delayed on necessarily. So we're making yeah. good progress. We're aiming this year as in 24, 25, but we're aiming for 24. Obviously, I mean, the sooner we get this in, the better. So I don't think we're too far in terms of having a piece of draft legislation that we can introduce. There's no reason to believe that you've no particular concern that it won't be delayed no. in this year. But okay, and now just in terms of the. Um, uh, in terms of what's here, um, the um, why isn't some of the things that are here? They won't remove. They won't get down back down to zero. The the, the black box. There's always new things being added to the black box. But d would you be confident that the next time we look at a um, the next budget bill, we'll have a significantly small? I forgot what the amount is that was in the last budget bill under show authority, but. I don't know the figure off the top of my head. I yeah. think maybe forty million plus yeah. something. I wouldn't say a figure, but this will deal with some of the matters that it requires yeah. some authority, particularly the, the TO things, or maybe one or two other things. So I think it'll it'll tidy up some of those matters, but certainly not all of the matters. Like the welfare mitigation um, will, will be you know tidied up by this. So we'll deal with some of the, the black box stuff. Uh, it will be the medic all the welfare mitigations will be dealt with in this. No, 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 no they no. won't. Yeah, and why not? Just because it's, it's the. Well, I guess I mean the financial provisions bill is routine, uncontroversial, you know. So I think the, the, the feeling was that you know, at the end of the day we went to departments, we asked them what they wanted included in this. We based the, the, the draft proposals on what departments provided to us. So DFC, you know, didn't put that forward as, as one of the items, and obviously it's think, controversial. Well, it was well I, I guess they felt that it just didn't fit the bill in terms of what it. Financial evasion spell is meant to do, which is do with routine, regular, yeah. general, right. and controversial stuff. Okay, and so uh, the idea being that this is such a large quantum of spending, or such a big deal, that it wouldn't be appropriate to put it in the financial provisions bill? Yeah, I would think that's correct. Okay. Yeah, I would suspect something like welfare mitigation would require its own legislation rather than. It sort of carries on as the, in this sort of strange uh, demi monde of being. I think it would huge. be better. I, I don't think we can speak on behalf of DFC officials, I think. It does mean, I suppose, that it is legally a bit more... It can be... It's legally more insecure than it otherwise would be, uh, as a, the, the mitigations are not... They don't have their own specific legislative provisions, so it's, as it were, quicker and easier to phase them out than it would be if it had its own legislative vehicle. Yeah. I think it's for us to say, I mean, it's, it, yeah. it'll continue relying on the sole authority of the Budget Act, I guess is all we can say at this stage. Okay, just a couple of votes, and we'll bring in colleagues. So please do obviously indicate if you wish to come in. Um, just to, to ask on a couple, and I'm aware that um, these will not all be Department of Finance things, and they'll be you, you're effectively op operating a bit as the as the legislative agent for for some of these changes, uh, rather and the the overall project manager rather than the um, what are the tourism tourism NI powers? What are the specific things that what 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 additional financial powers are tourism NI going to have? I think it's around um, exempting fees, charging fees. Okay. I think one of the things they want to do is extend the activities that they can charge fees for. So obviously they would you know, accredit um, hotels and accommodation and so on. I think they want to extend that to like visitor attractions and tourist attractions and so on. I think that's primarily what the, their provision is about. <coughs> It would allow them to charge for more things, basically. I'm not saying they will. I'm not saying they're definitely going to, but I'm saying it would le legally create the possibility. Make Give them the and I think that's one of the things about this legislation. It just gives other departments the ability to do that. So we're not setting fees and charges. This we're, we're, we're giving departments the authority to be able to do that. So that's one of the things that the tourism and I profession will do. So it's more flexibility and um, kind of extension of what they can charge or you know charge a fee for. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in terms of the um, uh, the um, no, it's from what I can see here the what's happening on behalf of in relation to housing executive housing associations is not the dramatic new it's not dramatic new borrowing powers for them it's no. relatively modest things. It's about, it's about tenancy fraud, and this is really to enable a housing executive to carry out tenancy fraud and fast investigations on behalf of a housing associations. So that's what the powers are around. And it's associated with that then is data sharing um, in order to allow them to do those tenancy fraud investigations. So that's what that relates to. Okay. Uh, final question for me before I bring in others. In terms of, um, uh, there's obviously a perennial subject we discuss in this committee um, is 
use or underuse of financial transactions capital. If there was, so one of the frustrations of the, the or not one of the frustrations, one of the observations, the reasons why FTC is, under, is the limitations on the number of bodies, obviously it has to be essentially a private sector um, entity, but I suppose there are clever ways you could interpret that, or if you were going to create the power for individual departments to create vehicles that could make use of FTC, would a financial provisions bill be the way you might do it? Because I guess ultimately that's decided by what is classified as a private sector body. Yeah. You know, and that's ONS determine what is a private yeah. sector entity or not. So this is about giving DOF the power to <coughs> lend money, lend FTC, um, in respect of the investment fund. D DOF hadn't had the power, and also giving DFE the power to lend FTC as well. And that's one of the provisions that DFE wanted. Okay. Okay, um, I'm going to bring it over, uh, Deputy Chair. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to you all for coming here today. I just wanted to ask around the increasing of the limit on advances from the Consolidated Fund and ask you to give a bit of detail on what you feel the wider implications around that are. Well, as you know, at the minute, there's a 2% limit on, on what we can um, use to give advances from the Consolidated Fund. So we, we've the proposal is just to increase that to four percent, and I think that's just—it's just seen as a prudent, sensible measure, an additional safety net to take account of exceptional um, kind of situations that may arise when, you know, for whatever reason, departments get to the, um, you know, get to the limits in terms of the photo of the account, and before you know the budget bill gets short of cent. So, I think it's a safety net measure. This just to give additional security, um, say in the event of, of exceptional circumstances may arise. Even though it's small in percent, we know that that's quite significant in number in terms of um, the value of public sector funds. And I just wondered, um, are you, would you be considering or planning to put any further governance measures into place if you were going to be increasing that facility? No, we, we, we don't believe that's needed. I mean, this isn't going to change any powers other than just having you know, an increased percentage. And um, I mean, I think you're right. It's a small percentage, but that relates to a big number. And if we increase that to 4%, it's, you know, it's an even bigger number again. But just you know, with, with the, you know, the scale, for example, of expand that might happen later in the year, coming up to SSEs, and we're dealing with AME, you know, um, transfers coming across from the UK government and so on, you, you could potentially be dealing with large sums of money. So I think it's really just to deal with those sorts of scenarios. If they, you know, should they arise, they may not arise. We don't expect them to particularly arise, but we think it's just an, an additional safeguard in the event that something exceptional does happen. We do need to... Um, you know, I think it'll, it. it'll always be our, our DOF's intention to bring forward a budget bill in good time. However, recent events have shown that that's not always happened. And I think this is just an extra measure we want to put in place to prevent departments running out of cash, you know. And there have been times when we thought the 2% limit hasn't really gave us enough flexibility. So by increasing it to 4%, it's going to just give departments a bit more flexibility that we can have more time to put a budget bill in place, okay. And I think the other thing is, <clears throat> although an advance will be taken, if an advance is taken, it always has to come back to the Assembly to be recognised. Yeah. You know, so the assembly ultimately always have a have a role in approving it. And it's repayable, of course, as well. Yeah. Yep. No, absolutely. And um, I think everyone in this committee is well versed in saying we would all like to see a budget bill coming through in good time and uh, go through the process that way. Thanks very much, Chair. Okay, um, Jerry Carroll is next, and obviously anybody else who wishes to come in, please indicate. Yeah, thank you. A um, couple of questions. Thanks for your presentation. Um, the marine licence uh, fee was mentioned. Um, is that a standard annual thing? Um, is it increasing under this bill? Um, is it going down? What is the figure around that? Um, I've also some unease about a tenancy fraud investigation. Uh, and as I understand it, new powers um, that the housing executive will have. I mean, we're in a situation where there's a there's a housing crisis. Houses are not being built at any um proper scale and yet there's there's powers to um have more investigation of, of tenants so um 
maybe to expand upon that, but it's, it's uh, uneasy with, with me. Um, uh, the mineral, uh, petro mineral and petroleum accounts um, aspect, um, what uh, level of finance is involved in that? And obviously, given the, the fact that we shouldn't be uh, digging up the ground for extraction uh, um, of these hyper minerals, how does that fit in with you know climate targets, but also the, the general ethos of being um, moving away from extractivism? And then the final question is around the DFI smart pass. Just to put on record, I don't think there should be any fee uh, for a smart pass. Um, and uh, I and others um, campaigned strongly recently uh, against that. So uh, some answers and clarity on that would be helpful. Thank you. Right, thanks. I, I should just say, um, I have had people ask summary indications of what measures are, and I did that. Um, and obviously the officials, and you're perfectly in order to ask those questions, Jerry, just to say the officials here might not have all of these details because they're not responsible for the detailed policy in any of these, in most of these areas, but but, have, but fine for it to go on the record. And if there are any particular insights they have on them, that's, that's fine. Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, thanks. I mean, in terms of the, the DARE one, the marine licensing, so the understanding is what DARE want to do there is to go to a situation where it's full cost recovery in terms of what it costs them to administer these marine licensing licenses. So that could be for a firm that wants to do dredging along the coast, it could be for renewable um, energy, that sort of thing. So the fees could range from a few hundred pounds up to thousands of pounds, depending on the scale of activity, how profitable that activity could potentially be and so on. So my understanding is at the minute, DERA generate around £100,000 in revenue from that licensing um, activity at the minute. And if they did full cost recovery, it would be about 600000 So that's the amount of additional revenue that, or income that, we, that would be generated through these, through these uh, changes. So it's, it's about full cost recovery in terms of the activities they do. Um, I think the second one was around the tenancy fraud one. So as I said, this is about really the housing executive carrying out that tenancy fraud investigation on behalf of the housing association. So housing executive do it at the minute, obviously, for the, in relation to their own tenants. Mm. So this is, I suppose, centralising that function within the housing executive. So they would do that activity for housing associations. Um, the DFI one, um, in terms of smart passes, uh, I think it is that issue where we are supposed to legislate the vehicle to give DFI the power to introduce smart passes should they wish to do so. We understand it is they've carried out a review, they looked, looked at lots of options around smart passes. This is one of the measures, this is a measure that they have decided they want to introduce. They say it is something that will help with the ongoing sustainability of the policy by again, recovering the cost of administering the scheme is my understanding. So, but it's, it's a DFI policy matter. They'll set the fees. This legislation won't set the fee. It'll give DFI the power to set a fee in relation to those. The mineral and petroleum accounts is a largely technical matter. It's really just kind of consolidating those accounts within the main departmental accounts. Um, I mean, I th I, so it's kind of extraction, so it's petroleum extraction, mineral, mineral extra extraction, is, and it's licensed in relation to that. The types of, uh, the amounts of money involved in both of those, I'm not sure we're going to find out. I think we looked for a set of petroleum accounts and couldn't find any online. <coughs> I don't think anybody's drilling for oil at the minute here, so there mustn't be anything coming out, but we, we, we can go and ask and, and find out what sort of money is involved in both those sets of accounts and, and come back to you with that detail. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Can I, can I just um, sure. I appreciate the, the answers are given and, and as well as the accounts, can um, we also get a bit more information as a committee around the mineral and petroleum um, sort of powers, because obviously there's a concern amongst um, Many across the north about you know um, licensing being given out to um, extracting uh, companies and it would sit on well with me if this bill would allow that to happen to expand. So a bit more information for the committee on that would be useful. But thank you. I presume it, 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 this bill would have nothing to do with the decision on whether or not to grant licenses. It would be about the financial. It would be about sh theoretically should such exist. But it's worth asking the question 
if we could have an answer to the question, I suppose what's interesting is why are the department asking for this power um, mm. in, the, in that context? Under the existing legislation, yeah. uh, the FE are required to show separate accounts for petroleum and mineral licensing. Okay. And I understand them them accounts are quite small. At the minute, I don't think there's any petroleum license in Northern Ireland. Mm. I looked, I couldn't find any details of mineral licensing. But again, I don't think these are large accounts. And the recommendation is that these accounts are going to be incorporated inside the, the departmental accounts. So it's just doing away with that older legislation and letting letting all those accounts be so incorporated into, yeah, consulted into the DFE accounts. That's solely what it is. So it's not about the licensing and, and the permitting of license. It's all just about a administration of how these accounts are presented. Okay, so, so at the minute there are theoretically separate accounts for uh, revenues from licensing, which of which there's barely any or none. So this is just a... Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, next is Steve Aiken. Steve. He's not on it, you don't f- Like Bally Clare, I think, is not is it's slightly incommunicative. We can hear can you hear us? No? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Okay. But, oh, it's, everything's slowing down. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll speak quickly because otherwise it's just got to keep on going and going. Uh, just a very, very quick one. Uh, FTC, why just the Department of Finance and the Department of Economy? Uh, bearing in mind that FTC could be used indeed for infrastructure projects or for indeed any education or health. Uh, why just those two departments? And the second one you said in the explanatory notes, it says it's a temporary measure from because of SIB have been doing it. How long has it been a temporary measure and why is SIB not deemed to be an appropriate body to continue doing it? Well, the, the, the DOF rationale relates to the investment fund. I mean, the investment fund was introduced in 2017. It was always intended that DOF would issue the loans to the investment fund. Um, it didn't have the power at that stage. So it was agreed at that stage that TEO for SAB would do it on a temporary basis until such times that DOF got the power, because SAB had the power to issue, issue loans. So it's, it, it, it's been long overdue to, to kind of address that and give the power to DOF, and the vehicle for doing so was always expected, to, always anticipated to be a financial reasons bill. It's just been delayed until now. So it's, it's been temporary, but... TEO are, are happy that it comes across to us. We're more than you know. We we believe it should come across to, to DOF. So it's it's to do with the investment fund. I just ask. I'm, I'll let you back in a second. Like, other than just it's tidy or it's tidy mindedness, and that's fair enough. Is like, was there a specific substantive concern? I mean, was there a theoretical possibility that the minister, or the Department of Finance, wants this project to be funded? Um, I presume a lot of their stuff wouldn't go to the executive to be. Uh, deemed to be cross-cutting or controversial, but theoretically, because the if it's going by TO, it's theoretically under the the a minister theoratically in TO would have the power to say no, you can't disperse that money. Is in that terms of the investment fund, DOF doesn't decide where those pro- where those loans ultimately go to. We give money to the fund, and fund managers decide how that fund should be allocated, and that's really important in terms of it being FTC and you know private sector um you know it's given to a private sector body i mean the, the fund itself is a private sector entity yeah so, so the what i'm saying is theoretically is there a theoretical legal case that at the minute uh, someone in TO could say could put a hold on money going out if the money's theoretically being dispersed it, it's not theoretically it is being dispersed effectively from TO at the minute so could, is, is the concern that someone could judicially review you know that, or not judicially review but that uh, someone could theoretically say well actually i don't want that to go there no, the, I, I don't think there's any concern. I mean, it's simply that SAB are the vehicle being used to, you know, enable the, the, the loan to go to be lent to the investment fund. They were the vehicle around at the time when the, the, the investment fund yeah. was was created. It was always intended to be a temporary measure until okay. such times that DOF got the power to do so. Yeah. It, it, at okay. that time, SAB had the, le- the legal barriers to make them loans where DOF hasn't. Yeah. And if we didn't go through the SIB route, the loans that we are, that have been issued to date wouldn't have happened because yeah. we haven't. No, I get that. I, I get that. I'm, I'm just but in, intrigued by why. The, the only reason that we're now, it was always the agreement that 
we were going to take forward legislation and move this policy area back to DOF because it is our policy. So the, the, budget, the budget is given to 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 give the SAP and there's a memorandum of understanding that kind of governs all that. Sure. Okay. Steve, sorry I interrupted. The second point quite simply is, you know, as I said, we went out to, in January to ask what departments wanted included in um, the financial provisions bill. DFE came back and said one of the things they'd like to have included was the ability to uh, issue, issue FTC loans and you know, I suspect it's just you know, given the nature of what DFE do and the SNI, I guess they saw it as something that would be useful for them to have that power to do so. Okay. Well done, Steve. Okay. Uh, next is Paul Frew. Yeah, just, and again, uh, the first question is going to be that general question uh, the Chair alluded to with regards to the fact that you're really just an agent pushing this uh, bell through mm. for other departments. So. So, how can you be confident that every, sing, every single thing that these other departments are asking for uh, is the right direction of travel? Well, we, we, we expect each department to do their own analysis of whatever policy they want to implement through this financial provision, to do whatever equality impact is necessary, to do those regulatory impacts assessments, and to consult as necessary. So. Each department will do their individual policy development process. We're simply legislative vehicle that's needed in order to give kind of legislative effect to those because each of those, you know, matters on their own wasn't deemed, um, you know, suitable for its own piece of legislation. So, and for some of the matters, it is, you know, a, a tidying up, dealing with sole authority and so on. But generally, we expect each department to deal with whatever, you know, policy development matters they need to deal with. So. And I, I don't mean to get in a political sphere for you guys, but you imagine a debate on this bill and Philip Brett been really annoyed about the the charge to smart pass. How does how does the minister or how do you develop how do the uh, officials behind the minister um, address Philip Brett's concerns? In terms of the smart pass, um it has to remember this bill, we have put an executive paper <coughs> to the executive and they have looked at all the provisions and they have agreed the provisions that are going to go into the bill. So ultimately we are doing this on behalf of the executive, not on behalf of DOF. As well as that, each of the departments and their officials, have, some of them have done public consultation, some of them are doing targeted consultation. A lot of them, well they'll all be going to their committees to discuss it. The DFE were at their committee last week and the DFE committee have signed off on the DFE provisions. Likewise, I, I, the DF, DFI will be going to their committee, and if concerns are going to be raised, that probably would be the appropriate place to raise them. Ooh. And in terms of the DFI and the Smart Pass, we are just putting through the legislative power for them to introduce a fee if they will. So after we put through the power, it'll be up for the DFI minister to make a decision whether or not he wants to introduce a fee, and then also come up with a fee scheme and set that fee. So there will be further scrutiny as this goes through the process. So who then, because you guys, you guys are holding this baby, <laughs> right or wrongly, uh, this piece of legislation. So what happens if, who, who makes decisions on amendments? So if someone, if an MLA oh, decides, <laughs> no, 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 but no. So, well, who makes the decisions whether you guys agree with amendments or not? So you guys are Department of Finance officials there could be an MLA brings forward an, uh, an amendment that uh, changes some of the provisions for the Department for Economy. How do you guys negotiate whether that amendment's a good one or a bad one, whether the Minister should support it or not? I take the point, and, and I mean, financial provisions bills are intended to be, you know, they deal with matters that are cross departmental, they deal with, um, you know, on contentious routine tidying up those sorts of things so i guess the issue generally doesn't arise because of the nature of financial provisions bill but i mean i suppose i just point to yes there is a legislative process there'll be a consultative process around the legislation you know it'll come to committee stage you can consult on that the department has consulted on it so there will have been ample opportunity for people to give their views on this mm -hmm. So most, mo a lot of bills, in fact, probably most bills are cross-departmental and some guys are not, or cross-cuttings, I suppose is the phrase to use. 
But usually the department who's sponsoring the bell knows the mind and knows the, the essence of that bell. It can't necessarily be said here. Um, how many types of this type of bell have come across your desks in the past? Look, I say the previous financial occasions bill was 2014, the one before that was 2009, and they both in included provisions that were outside the Department of Finance, so I think it's a regular feature of financial provisions. Well. Um, I'm going I'm to try and ask you about the, the, the provision around the apprenticeships from the Department of, for Economy. Um, but it sounds the things that basically removes Section 1 of the Employment and Training Act, Northern Ireland, 1950 which uh, I had here. Um, it's basically 1C of Section 1. No payment shall be made by the Department by virtue of any power conferred by this section unless the Department of Finance personnel has approved the amounts of the payments or the manner of determining those amounts and the terms on which they are made or the manner of determining those terms. So, will this just remove 1C or will it remove Section 1? It will take DOF out of the loop, essentially. So it will mean that DFE will be able to you know, continue to uh, implement apprenticeships and so on and make payments in relation to those apprenticeships without the need to come to DOF for approval. Mm. And that's really what that's intended to do, and we're supportive of that because we don't feel it needs to come to DOF for approval. In the real world, we have a situation where NRC have made no provision for teaching first-year apprentices in the electrical installation uh, course uh, because they haven't the uh, tutors to teach which has left a massive hole gap in the recruitment for the electrical in uh, industry installation industry is there anything in this provision that would actually help uh, fix that and make sure that there are tutors who are paid appropriately in order to teach apprentices that's what this, that's what that's not what this provision is around. This provision is solely around um, an irregularity that was essentially spotted by the audit office mm -hmm. that said that qualified, I believe, DFE's accounts in twenty twenty one because the legislation said that DOF should have given approval for that spend and DOF hadn't, so it was irregular. So that's just meant to fix and address that. Were you guys involved in the previous provisions bills? Think any of us around at that time? No. Why well, ask us? Uh, we might seek. We might need, as a committee, to seek uh, advice as to how we would actually scrutinise something that is cross departmental and jurisdic jurisdictional. Yeah, to a degree, <coughs> we will be relying very heavily on the other committees to do the work relevant to their department. Th these bills are one of this size and scale chair is very uncommon but it, it's not uncommon to have bills that involve two or three departments um i know members will have experienced those in various other committees and you you are looking at very heavy reliance on other committees to scrutinize their part the difficulty obviously comes when you bring all that together um and especially if those other committees have particular issues with what's being brought forward by their department that's when you get into the the realm of very complex amendment but we'll we'll not worry about that just yet but it is complex very complex sounds great fun looking forward to it thank you okay next paul owen thank you chair and mine's a, a very brief question just on the um consolidated fund uh, advance that diane had been had been talking about how does that four percent compare to what other devolved administrations are, are doing in GB, it's it's two percent. Okay, uh, they did increase it during COVID. In one of the COVID years, they increased the the contingency to fifty percent, and then the following year, I think it was from memory twelve percent. Okay. I th I believe it's also two percent in Scotland. I tried to find their legislation, but couldn't have covered for today. But we'll continue investigation. But and I think in Wales, it's zero point five percent. You know. And is there a particular rationale why Northern Ireland would need to be? higher the thinking is that there has been I'm trying to be diplomatic <laughs> there has been Don't be diplomatic for yeah. well, with, with recent Barfish. events with the executive not being in place there has been delays to the budget bill yeah. uh, and it has reduced the timetable for DOF to get a budget bill done and to get royal assent which means that 
some departments have felt un under pressure in terms of their cash limits. And, and that's what this is solely about, is to make sure cash can be provided to departments in lieu of a budget bill being in place. Well, and look, I, I think it's a fairly reasonable analysis given um, recent history. If I put my political hat on, if we reformed the Assembly so it couldn't be pulled down again, we wouldn't have that problem and we wouldn't need to, to enhance the, the advance. Okay. One comment from me, Chair, just before we move on around the, the mineral and petroleum accounts, because I know DFE lead on it and I don't want to ask you guys questions about a policy area that you're not responsible for. Yeah. Um, but I think Jerry does have a point in that there are no active licences and the Minister has indicated in the Chamber that he intends to bring a ban on petroleum licensing, so I get the theoretical tidy up, but why bother doing it? Um, unless there's something outstanding maybe in the Mineral Development Act that we're not aware of, so I think it is a fair question to get a bit of clarity on. So, so I think there are probably going to be a range of things where we will want to write to other departmental committees to say, Matt, so I think... Um, and. Uh, assuming the member, uh, no other member wishes to come in, I think there will be a range of areas where there will be interesting and important things to scrutinise and follow up. Uh, some of them will involve the individual departments. I suspect what might happen in some instances is the departmental committees might assume, oh, that that's the finance, the finance committee's doing that, and we need to. I think we and the departmental officials need to be ready to scrutinise and answer and make sure those are answered. So I think that's right. Um, can I suggest that we, obviously we're going to, we are going to get a bill later that we write and initially, if we haven't, um, that's already in my speaking note, which is helpful. Thank you very much. My chair's brief already suggests such a thing. Um, uh, but I can I, but it's good that we're thinking in unison uh, that we write to the relevant statutory committees indicating that their people are content that their opinions will be sought, but I think we should also flag to them that there will be specific areas where their scrutiny will be necessary. Um, there is a slight risk, I suppose, that, I mean, you're clearly across the, 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 the detail of this, but are you alive to the risk that clearly other departments are the ones in the lead in their individual policy areas, and they're the ones who have requested tidying up to happen, mm -hmm. but there is also a kind of the overarching job of the Department of Finance is control, is spending control and control of devolved finances. So I presume you are exercising a degree of saying, no, actually, we don't think that's an approach. Has that process already happened? And is the department content yeah. that all of these are necessary? And I mean, I think why? We, have, we have had some discussions with departments who have also sought the advice of OLC in relation to, you know, to this matter. Um, so there. There, there may have been things that may have been put forward that haven't ended up in this because of it. Can you give me any examples? Yeah, I can, yeah. Um, I'll have to take them out. <laughs> we, we can come back to you, maybe, if you don't have them okay. on. But I know there were other okay. things I think that were put forward. I think there were three items put forward that we didn't include. Okay. Okay, the first one was a DFE wanted to a provision to a, for the government indemnity scheme, which provides insurance. I think it's for artefacts, you know, art pieces. That function transferred across to DFC and they wanted to tidy up. We consulted OLC and it was determined that instead of the financial provisions bill that should be included within a transfer of functions act as a policy. Yeah. But let's that, that was the Department of Economy who wanted to yep. currently the what the, the virus to have indemnity on cultural artifacts belongs to DFC. It, it it's with DE. DE, it's with DE, but they wanted DE, to go but to DFC. The DFC have to go to DE to get it, and they want to remove the DE, the DE approval rule. They want to transfer that function to DFC completely. The other one was ending violence against women and girls. There was a discussion whether TE would include that in this bill. We thought that that was a standalone piece of legislation, a more substantive piece of legislation, which wouldn't suit this bill. Excuse me, but what is the vi what's the ending violence against women and girls? I, but what, what what's the financial provision that is the they were looking, it, again, it was because they were within the sole authority of the Budget Act. Ah, OK, and so right. So, so. And they thought that they could use this bill as a way to amend that. And then yeah. we thought, no, that they needed a more substantive piece of that. OK, that's fine, yeah. And then the third piece was, there was a proposal to give all departments a power to give grant. And in discussions with OLC, we, it was determined that this wasn't possible because there was no... For every department to be able to give grants? Grant. <coughs> there was no limit to the power. You know, yeah. and to have a, a piece of <coughs> legislation like that, you need a, a limit on the limits of the power. So you can't just give a, all departments the ability to give grant. They have to give grant for a, a purpose. 
Some departments obviously can give grants. They can give grants, for example. The, the economy could give Europe grants could give for economic grants, development. Yeah. This yeah. was a general power to give grant. And right. It was turned down because there was no, there was no proposed limits on that. So there were and where did that proposal come from? I think it came from TEO. But it was... Okay. Once we discussed with OLC, it, it, it didn't seem suitable for this bill. Okay. <coughs> Just, you know, if any other members wish to come in, please indicate. Otherwise, we'd we'll like to thank the officials for their time. We obviously have actions to take forward, and we will be hearing more from you later, uh, hopefully later in the year, whenever we have a, a financial provisions bill. That was really useful, and, and, and good that we were able to have a, a pre-legislative meeting. So thank you very much for your time, Patrick, Ian, and Sarah. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Oh, we talked about the public bodies and the different colours. Yeah, yeah. Which would be good. But I hear there's a lot more power in the grants and so on. That would have been a standalone. But it would have been much more about sure. okay. the more about the water rights and just like that. Interesting, OK. Um, so, members, um, we now have a uh, uh, an oral briefing from the department uh, on um, on budget broad budget matters, um, uh, you will be aware. Obviously, lots has been happening. Um, so um, we uh, we thought it would be helpful last week to have an urgent briefing from uh, from departmental officials. Um, there will be a range of things uh, uh, to be discussed. Um, obviously, since we last had a briefing from this team in the department, there is a new UK government. Uh, lots of things have happened to that new UK government. Obviously, there's been a, um, they have done their uh, fiscal statement of sorts in July. Um, we've also had um, the um, uh, announcements last week, um, which we have given our views on already. And we know that there has been um, various communications between the executive and the minister specifically and her counterparts in the Treasury. So it's really helpful to get, and we also know that we are. Um, the budget sustainability work stream is being um, extended into September, uh, presumably based on conversations with the Treasury as well. Um, and obviously, uh, the programme for government has been published. So, um, quite a few things, but we have two very um, senior and experienced officials um, to brief us on that. Um, so, if you, if you wish to note um, uh, that at page, uh, and, and, uh, in addition to the urgent summer exercise, um, if you look at page 164 of the meeting pack, um, uh, you will uh, you will see um, the, um, the 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 indication, and I quote: "Due to the scale of forecast overcommitments, the finance minister wrote to the executive, and an urgent in-year exercise was commissioned on the 5th of August to determine the scale of forecast overcommitments across all departments, including the cost of meeting 24-25 public sector pay awards, and actions being taken by departments to manage the overcommitments as part of this." Uh, exercise departments identified over commitments totaling some £767 million. Pounds. The Finance Minister has updated executive colleagues on the in-year position and the executive will be considering its approach later this month. My, under or my recollection is that the Finance Minister indicated that her c the department's current estimate was that that would reduce, the Barnet in-year consequences would reduce that by about £500 million, but that was an, an indication. But then that obviously still leads to, leaves £200 plus million of pressures. That, in conjunction with all of the other longer-term um, things uh, we, we, we would hope to discuss today. Um, and at last week's meeting, the, the Deputy Chair made a, a point in relation to the Department uh, um, uh, uh, anticipating peaks and troughs um, in departmental expenditure, so we may wish to raise that as well. Okay, um, so thankfully we have two, as I said, very senior officials. Um, uh, Joanne McBurney, who's well known to us, and Jeff McGuinness, who's returned to the department, um, uh, but presumably to serve a penance for some sin uh, committed in, in an earlier life, Jeff. Um, but I'm sure he'll be, they'll make it as painless, or we'll make it as painless as possible. But thank you very much um, to the officials. Um, I don't know if you want to give us, we, we, I know you, a lot, in fairness, has been happening, so it would have been probably impossible to capture in a pithy written brief, and you are doing a lot, but I don't know if you want to give us an, an update, Joanne slash Jeff, on where you think things are, both in year and in the longer term, in the various work streams. Yep, thank you, Chair. I mean, I'll start with some opening remarks. Um, I know you're keen to touch on a number of areas yeah. today, including the meeting last week with the Chancellor, current budget position, and I'm conscious that you'll also want to discuss city deals, so I'll provide a very brief update, but realise that you'll want to have the opportunity to ask a number of questions. 
Starting with the city deals, you'll know from both the Minister's oral statement in the Chamber Monday and the written ministerial statement today that this has been a quickly evolving situation. We only became aware of this decision when we were informed by a Treasury official that, um, and I'm quoting from the email here, the current position is that all city and growth deals across Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland would be considered through the spending review. That was last Wednesday. We alerted the Minister, who informed her executive colleagues, and raised this with the UK Government the next day with the Chancellor in London. During that meeting, the First Minister, Deputy First Minister and Finance Minister laid out the dire consequences such a decision would have and urged for a reconsideration. The Chancellor advised the Finance Minister to engage with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury in the matter. The Finance Minister wrote that evening to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and asked for an urgent call. This was followed up by the Minister's team on Friday morning, both in email and by telephone, when it was made clear that the Minister would make herself available, including over the weekend. On Friday, NIO convened a call with representatives from the four deals and set out the UK Government's decision to pause the funding commitments. Official and political discussions continued into and over the weekend. On Saturday evening, the Secretary of State confirmed to the Minister that the Derry City and Strabane District Council City deal signing would be going ahead. Following this, late on Sunday, the Secretary of State's office confirmed that following communication with the Treasury, nothing has changed on the status of the Belfast City deal. The Minister met with the CST and Secretary of State on Monday evening and made clear that the pause must be lifted immediately on the Causeway Coast and Glens and Mid South West growth deals. The Minister set out that there should be no disparity between deals and highlighted the considerable time, effort and commitment which has gone into these deals over many years. As I'm sure you realise, um, Gillian Gilmore leads on City yep. and Growth Deals in my team, and Gillian would have been with us today, but the Derry Deal signing event was this morning, and she is at the Council Partnership panel meeting with the Minister yep. this afternoon, and given the ongoing issues, it was important that she's there. Yep. I'll do my best to answer your questions, and we'll come back on anything that I can't answer. Um, conscious of eating too much into the time for questions, I've already touched on the Chancellor's meeting last week, but also to add that this was used as an opportunity to discuss the progress made in the interim fiscal framework and the need to continue to build on this as well as to make representations ahead of the upcoming budget that it needs to be used as an opportunity to prioritise investment in public services and public sector workers. The Minister also updated the Chancellor on the work on the Budget Sustainability Plan and the financial challenges facing the Executive. And as you've already noted, I'm joined by Jeff McGuinness, who I am very delighted has returned to the Department, and he will be leading on this area of work, and he'll provide an update uh, for you all. Is on the fiscal framework? He's or? leading on the Budget Sustainability budget Plan. Sustainability. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he, I didn't quite manage to get him back into his old job. He's, he's escaped to something slightly different. Okay, okay. Um, just touching on the overcommitment position, you'll be aware from the forecast outturn provided last week that the financial position facing the executive remains incredibly challenging. The minister commissioned an urgent exercise over the summer to get a clear picture of the current financial position. That exercise was commissioned because of those forecast outturn returns and the information in them. Unfortunately, um, as part of that exercise, departments have reported that they have resourced Dell over commitments of £767 million above their current budget position. The greatest pressures are in health, education and justice, which together account for almost 90% of the total pressure. We know there will be further Barnet consequences this year because of allocations in England, but we will only get full certainty on our share towards the end of the year. Um, there may be some certainty around the Chancellor's October budget, but normally um, in your consequences are only confirmed at supplement Westminster supplementary estimates in January. The Minister has been clear that she's not willing to delay until then as departments must be provided with additional funding to stop deterioration of services and to enable them to plan and make decisions. The Minister intends to bring proposals to the Executive to increase departmental budgets by our latest assessment of what our Barnet share will be. It's expected that this will allow the allocation of around 500 million. While this will fall short of the overcommitment departments are currently recording, it will go a significant way towards addressing the pressures. All ministers will have to play their part in living within their budget once this funding is provided to ensure a balanced budget is delivered. The executive will be considering its approach, and I'm limited on what detail I can provide in advance of that, but I will try my best to answer your questions. Um, I'm happy to take any questions you have on any of those areas okay. or anything else. Thank you, Joanne, and thanks, Jeff. Um, that was a very useful overview, and there, there are a range of things. Appreciating that the all of these are obviously moving situations, and the, some of the granular detail around city and growth deals is for Jillian and other officials. But you'll be able to give us a sense of some of the conversations that have happened in the last week. So, I mean, first of all, and I mean, before we get into questions, is broad consensus that the shambolic and unacceptable handling of the city deal situation by UKG and the Treasury. I think it's probably worth getting on the record and unpacking some of, from your perspective, how that happened. Um, it sounds like what you've just told us is that an email came in from the Treasury 
this day, almost this time last week, like almost exactly this time last week, an email came in. Was that an email from a mid-ranking default spending official, or was it? Uh, and who, so I'm interested to know who got the email. And I don't, I'm not trying to demean people by you know being greatest about it, but I think it's important to understand quite how high level the communication was. Was this a an email from a very senior civil servant to someone like you or the permanent secretary, or was this a kind of mid-level official to mid-level official? Having been a mid-level official, I'm allowed to use that phrase. Yeah, I have also been that mid-level yeah. official, so we'll, we'll, we will not go there. I mean, it's not really for me to comment on the inner workings of the, the Treasury or yeah. the Northern Ireland office, but I think our minister has made clear to the CST, as I have made clear to Treasury colleagues, that we are not happy with, the, with how this has been handled. Yes, it was an email from a mid-level official in the Treasury spending yeah. team. The email went to members of the City and Growth Deal Delivery Board, so that is myself as, yeah. as the, the coach chair, the NIO counterpart and the representatives from the departments who are involved in the city deals and yes that issued last Wednesday. You'll understand that we did not, we did. Our, we immediately informed our minister obviously yeah. um, who wrote to her executive colleagues. We asked that that not go any wider because it had only came from that level of official. We wanted to raise it at the highest levels yes. to make sure we had a full understanding. There was absolutely no need at that time to um, unnecessarily alarm yeah. council partners or to damage confidence in the deals by yes. putting something out. So we did that on the Wednesday. The First Minister, Deputy First Minister and Finance Minister raised it with the Chancellor at their meeting in London on the Thursday. Did she know that this had happened? Did she raise? I couldn't comment on what the Chancellor knew or did not know at that point in time. I don't know. She advised uh, the Finance Minister to talk to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury and the letter was sent that same evening, despite travelling back from London at the time. And he didn't, the letter and, he, and he obviously took it. From what we understand, he didn't. He was not prompt in coming back, or as prompt as he would have might have been expected. Not as been. prompt as we would have liked him okay. to have been. I can't really comment on the on the reason behind, but not was, as prompt as we'd like. Had you had no indica- had the department had no indication between the fifth of July and last Wednesday that the spending was going to be paused. No. Nope. No. And it was. Is your understanding, and you might not be able to speak for the part, that this relates to all types of sort of regeneration capital expenditure is it all forms of previously allocated but not yet legally committed capex because clearly it covers scotland and wales too so it would just be helpful to know like is it, or is it just city and growth deals what are, what's been frozen because i understand particularly from counterpart here who's in the economy committee that leveling i think there's really one project here which is affected which happens to be in north belfast but What's been frozen from your perspective that you're... From the official communication, we were only advised of city and growth deals. Okay. Um, from wider conversations, one of the points the Chancellor made um, at, at, at the meeting, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously, going to memory, was that it was right that the incoming UK government, these were not their policy decisions, and it was right for them to ensure that any previous policy decisions represented value for money. Now, that would suggest that it's wider than city and growth deals, okay. but I have nothing other to base that on other than that. That remark we've only been informed about the city and growth deals. Is it the general impression that they've decided to do a a kind of an expansive zero based look at things but handled it and communicated it abysmally? Obviously they've obviously communicated and handled it abysmally, but um, they didn't give any indication. I mean, have they given any indication that in all probability, this particularly now the live question that we all want answered is what happens with Causeway, Coast and Glens and Mid Ulster? Have they said, hold on, pause? Is the expectation that pause that it's just being paused, but you can sort of go? There's a difference between saying this is being paused, but we'll confirm as soon as we can, and no, no, genuinely down tools because this is all being looked at from scratch. Do you know which it is? To be honest, no, we don't know which it is okay, at this point. What we're acceptable. being told is pause. It will be reviewed as part of the spending review. So. Information. Now, we're in engagement with Treasury, we'll continue engagement with Treasury, we have been engaging with, with the two deals that have been affected, the Minister has met with them twice already, we're engaging at official level, we're gathering questions, we will go back to Treasury news, but at the minute, very much in all situation, and the, the line we have at the minute is they're being considered as part of the spending review. Which is, I'm afraid, just absolutely, I am robust with your, your department <coughs> of when they speak, that is completely um, unacceptable. Is there, just to, to, to flush out, other areas where there's direct UK government expenditure here out with the kind of um, the Barnet and you know, the, the, the block grant? Um, 
So, for example, things like um, pre-existing, I don't know if there are any pockets of money still left that haven't been uh, un unring fenced or, or, or interfered with from fresh start or any of that. Have they given any, any, any indication that any of that, whatever's left in those uns those yeah, ring fence pots? Th th there, are, there are some um, previous funding streams still yeah. coming our way. No, we haven't had any indication, and I think our working assumption is that we will continue business as usual unless told otherwise. Okay, okay, yeah, and then they need to, yeah. So, and there are, so there are still some unspent pots from previous UK government commitments, but they need to, okay, fine. I just want to ask about um, a, a couple of other points, and I will bring, obviously, and the, the real others who want to come in, and please indicate if you haven't already, if you do want to come in, just on Casement Park, because that's another one of the final sort of <laughs> freaky Friday the 13th kind of presents. Um, was there any indication before Friday that this... Was there any indication before Friday that they were going to make this decision? No. No. So not, not, not that I, not that I'm no. aware of, okay. or, or my team. Now the the casement decision was communicated in a different way. That was NIO yes. rather than the Treasury. Is that right? That that is right. And um, I suppose it's worth noting that it was the NIO that communicated the decision to the deals to the Treasury. The, the Treasury communication that email was to civil servants, but. Yes, it was the NIO that, that communicated it. Oh, it was just what you were saying was on city deals. It was the Treasury that emailed your team. Yeah. But then the formal communication on the city deals on the Friday was from the NIO. Yes. And that happened, at a, we're going back to city deals here, but that happened at a point when you were still kind of trying to say, hold on, is there some massive misunderstanding yes. here? They then went, it was the NIO, it was the, presumably at the behest of the Treasury? Um, I can't comment on okay. what discussions went on, but it was the sure. NIO convened a meeting of representatives of the deal partners. Myself and Gillian did sit in on that meeting because we wanted, obviously, to hear yeah, what was yeah. being said, but it was the NIO was communicating Enough. the message. So ju just on case, um, was the department expecting an announcement from the UK government? No. You were, none at all? Certainly not expecting anything on Friday, and I'm not aware that we... No. Obviously, the issue was ongoing, and yes, we were pressing for a resolution. So you would have expected something at some point, but we weren't expecting an announcement on Friday. No, 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 I put part of the reason I'm slightly bemused by that, and I'm not saying that necessarily that the, the the Department of Finance would have been the, the, the lead, because obviously it's a, a community Perfect. project. Yeah. Project, but um, clearly it was in the media all last week that people were expecting a resolution from the UK government, some kind of indication. So there was there was no. Um, there was no, there was no warning at all. That w there was no indication that it w that there, that that you will get a resolution at some point in the next couple of weeks. Okay, that's useful to know. And um, now, just uh, to go back to m more local matters, I'm sure they'll others will want to go back to um, city deals, um, and I'll uh, and I will bring people in, in uh, uh, very shortly. Um, the budget sustainability plan has been delayed. I'm not saying it's being delayed out of it's being delayed because there's a new UK government in part you're negotiating with. Are you negotiating the contents of that budget sustainability plan with the new UK government? Jeff, do you want to comment? So we, we have been in ongoing regular engagement with um, Treasury officials on the budget sustainability <coughs> plan. Um, so we do a weekly meeting with them and we kind of verbally update them on where we are in the progress. So you, you update them on where you are, but you present the plan to them. You don't negotiate the, what's in that plan with them, is that what you're saying? The executive, once it's yeah. agreed, will publish the plan. It's not to be agreed with Treasury. And uh, the, the budget sustainability plan will include an update on the balance of revenue raising that has to be that is going to be done over the next two years. Is that the idea? It, it will include an update on the 113 million that was put out in the scope of the plan. Yes. So the, what I understood from the minister the other day in the chamber was that. My, the previous rough number I was working into my head was that 60 of the 113 had been so, sorted, had been covered by the regional rate rise, um, but actually she suggested the number's more like 80-something. So it sounds like if it's at 80-something, we really only have another 10 or 20 million to raise. So, so there's, there's a, there's a couple third. of things on that, Chair. Um, first of all, um, it'll... It, the, the projections for 24, 25 are reasonably firm. So ministers have made decisions, the executive made decisions yeah. on, on budget. So we know that um, 80 million pounds this financial year is, is expected to come in. Now, that will change at the end of the year. There will always be fluctuations in revenue raising. 80 million pounds is additional revenue additional, versus the start. And yes. that is comprised of the regional rate 
and yes, a number of other things. So the likes of um, NI Water non-domestic increases, um, right. the likes of tra- uh, TransLink fare increases, domiciliary care plant. Um, that's about twenty things. over twenty million of, of sort of operating of charges. That's that's re- that's released. So that was very good of the Treasury. To, they didn't specify then in, their, in the initial negotiation that you have to, it doesn't sound like those were decisions that the executive had to make. Those are sort of decisions that Chris Conway has to sign off on because they're fair increases. Um, so that's quite helpful. Because that's about, <laughs> yeah, so one might so, argue. Yeah, so we're, we're roughly talking about um, 50% of that 80 million being, up, being made up from rates income yeah. and then the other 50% roughly from other areas within um, government, yes. Okay. So yeah. clarification on that, it's just the 80 million. And uh, this, I'm, just, I'm in despair that the finance committee can't count. The finance committee chair can't count, right? Because yeah. you've just left 30 million out. So are you saying? No, I say I, I then said 30 because I, <laughs> between the 80 and the 113 is how you're talking about. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, no, I didn't. Uh, I must be a square. So, so you said then, just to clarify, because it's a very good point you've raised, Matthew. So are you saying that the 8 million is not all about the um, the rates? Yes, so in, in the 24-25 financial year, there'll be about 80 million, about 50% of that, around 40 million-ish, will come from rates. Regional in, rates. Yeah, and then the other 40 million-ish will come from um, changes within departmental income streams. Yes. Well, then we still have to find. Yes. So there's a, well, so it's 33 million or thereabouts. Um, but that doesn't have to be found in 24-25, that has to be found yes. in 25-26. And you get to, so that's okay because you negotiated over two years. Um, I will bring others in right now, but I just want to f- finalise one thing. The, the, we had a briefing last week from um, uh, LPS on the rates consultation. Is your expectation that there will, when the final budget sustainability plan is produced, that there will be a policy indication or a policy decision, or some form of indication on what, on ch- potential changes to the rate system to increase revenue from rates? So that will be referenced in the plan. Okay. Um, I, we will not come to decisions because obviously the Finance Minister hasn't made decisions on that yet, but okay. it certainly will be referenced in the plan. We should not expect in September a decision, to, I'm, do, I'm not saying this is what you're deciding, any changes to industrial derating, vacant property relief, whatever, you're, they're not going to be announced in September. It will be more vague than that, and will say that it's under consideration, or these things are under consideration. Yeah. So, so for twenty five, twenty six, and looking at the income, to a further additional income to meet that one hundred and thirteen million target. Um, the situation is obviously much more nuanced because we don't have a, a budget envelope yet. It hasn't been set by, um, by the spending review, and therefore ministers, absolutely rightly, shouldn't be made to commit to income. Uh, generation measures or, or changes to those measures without knowing the kind of the overall envelope that they're dealing with, including rates. So, um, what what the twenty five twenty six position in the plan will do will project, and it will it will go based on either department's best estimate of what the increases might look like next year, or failing that, if we have nothing to, to look at, we look at the same increase as we have had this year, and we'll just move you know. Re- replicate that into the next year um, and that's kind of the best estimate and we'll do a, a couple of different scenarios there it that. seemed like it's a relatively easy test 33 million not to trivialize it but uh, of, uh, of like a base you know a kind of the uh, any increase in the regional rate at all will probably cover that you would think i would the the 33 million is less than the revenue generated from this year's regional rate increase so it doesn't seem like it's a huge mountain to climb so people Control the conclusions of that, but um, I'm going to bring others in now because I've asked quite a few. First is the Deputy Chair, Diane. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming here today. Um, yeah, just to concur with what the Chair said, just shambolic and um, uh, just uh, blows your mind some of the behaviours over the weekend. And um, um, to be there in the thick of it, I just wanted to ask, you know, for your feedback in terms of, you know, late Friday night, um, all of this um, getting landed upon you. Why do you think the Labour government did that? I honestly don't know. Um, we have communicated with Treasury. Um, I think there may be miscommunications, as, as, as the chair said, relatively, you know, more junior levels of the team. I think things were handled badly. I don't think it was their intent. To be fair, I don't think it was their intention to handle it in that way. It's the way it played out. But as you say, it was very unfortunate and it caused a lot of uncertainty for the deals that weren't affected. And I mean, our feelings are with the two deals that are affected and we are continuing to push strongly that the pause must be lifted immediately. We can't wait till the spend review harm is being done now. Those people need certainty. Um, And the four deals 
it affects the whole of Northern Ireland. We need the four deals. It's, it's not enough to have the two deals. They're complementary to each other. We need the four deals, and we'll be pushing very strongly for that. But yes, the handling has been less than ideal. We have, we have made that clear. Yeah. So, and it's good, and you would have the support, I think, of you know, all MLAs in terms of that to have this landed on a Friday evening at the end of the work and week. Your civil servants are at home, your partners are at home, and everybody clambering to get together to try to understand what was happening and the communication of it just is not good for no. relationships at, at any level and hopefully going forward um, that will be reflected in um, how this is dealt with, although I don't have great confidence to be honest, it has set a really bad tone going forward. It really has and it was very difficult I, I, I think, I mean we could talk about civil service getting on but for those deal partners who were hearing that message for the first time on a Friday afternoon and not knowing what it meant for them and for the two deals that are left still not knowing what it means for them the, those councils and those partners are putting their own money into it at the moment delivering projects and they don't know whether to stop or continue so it, it, and we are pushing to get those answers and the Minister is being very firm and any other support that's coming, all MLAs being supportive of it is very welcome. A Minister has met twice with the with the chief execs of the deals affected and will continue to do so and we'll continue to work with them at an official level but all support I think at this point needs to be directed towards getting the right answer. Well absolutely and getting the answer for those two other deals yeah. because it is unfair that we've answers in two and not the other and for all of those partners. Um, just to uh, move on to the um, £767 million pounds that's been identified. I just wanted to ask in terms of process and um, it says here, you know, the, and you mentioned it, the Minister called for this urgent in-year exercise to call on this to identify it. And just in terms of the process, to me, in a, in a year where we've got extreme budget pressures, I feel that this number should, your hand should be on it on a month-to-month -month basis. It shouldn't have required the Minister to call for an urgent in-year exercise to report at this point £776 million because, again, I've raised it in, in other um, committee meetings before. To us, this is a big number and this has been pulled out of the bag of an urgent exercise. But really, if these commitments have been there and they're not new commitments, should we not have known in April here are the commitments May, here are the commitments June, and then we could identify any movements on this because I'm sure these aren't brand new commitments that will have existed up to a point in time. So for us to understand and be able to scrutinise it, we need to understand how many have always been there, how many have grown due to actions in year, um, and what we actually do about this and what it really, really means. So just really to understand why it required one urgent in-year exercise to identify this? Um, it didn't require the urgent in your exercise to identify it. We called the, in, the urgent in your exercise because we had identified it. Um, if you cast your mind back to the forecast outturn at the start of the year, departments were, we did allow departments to forecast over, over commitments that they had for this particular purpose, but we had the June monitoring com round coming and we knew that some departments were holding off on making decisions in the hope of getting money in that round and you'll remember that we, we allocated a substantial amount of money as part of that. It was only following the outworkings of that round when departments knew how much money they were getting that then the next forecast out from where we had expected those over commitments to fall drastically in fact I would have hoped then at that point all ministers would go that's okay I'll make these decisions to live within budget or here is my plan when we seen the responses to the, that forecast out turn coming in I think it was, it was 800 odd million we then went no hold on departments have their gin monitoring we need to we need to look at this in more depth and that is why that urgent in year exercise was called over over the summer period to push back to departments to say okay you're forecasting these over commitments what's your what is your over commitment what plans have you in place we're asking that as part of the forecast out turn and you, you will have received that i know the timings haven't been ideal the forecast out turn you only you only got sort of recently it just it takes time to work <coughs> the system. Um, but and as part of that, and then to do a bit of a deeper dive into what's your funded non-contractual pay costs, what's your unfunded non-contractual pay costs, what are your pay assumptions. So it was to give the forecast outturn coming in can be quite a routine thing for departments. They're giving us the information, but also to focus ministers' minds and permanent secretaries' minds, not to go right. Well, what is underpinning this? What what can be done? This is an urgent thing. We need to bring this to the executive. We set out in the forecast outturn guidance that if the overcommitments were concerning, we would bring it to the executive, and that was the reason. So it was already identified. The in-year exercises to get more detail to bring back to the executive to allow it to consider the way forward. No, absolutely. I just think, and you know, and, and we understand that, and we're, we're working with you um, month in, month out on these things. But use of the language, um, in terms of you know, an urgent in-year exercise to identify this money, um, to someone picking it up, it's. 
you know, it portrays that it, it wasn't noticed and it was a sudden yeah, thing that came to the attention. And I'm just trying to, you know, you know, I think it's important that we work together in terms of you know building public confidence of yeah. eyes. On, on the money. But I said, I can hold my hands up for if, if there was sloppy language, it wasn't identified as part of the exercise. It was identified and then the exercise was called. So yes, apologies. I can I can see why that would lead to that. So yeah. Just as I say, you know, like we know that it's being monitored, and I just want to make sure that it's captured in, in the fullest and possible way as to what's expected and what's unexpected. And um, kind of um, to the point Matthew mentioned before, um, you know, I had brought it up in terms of um, how we could best be placed in terms of cash flow forecasting throughout the year where again, where um, an advance comes in uh, from the consolidated fund from a department for us to be able to understand, was that an expected advance um, or was it unexpected or is it something that we should be concerned about? Was it something that has came up you know, out of nowhere? And like, I'm sure that you have that information and to you, it's not unexpected to say DERA have this in or DFC have this in because you know their spending pattern over the year. But is there some way that we can see that for um, it, it, it to be brought to us? Because we know in terms of the timings of the Budget Act, the advances, and there probably will be more coming through um, soon, just to know in terms of is it a cash flow timing as per the year, or um, is this something out of the ordinary? Because as I say, whenever we see it coming to the floor, coming in a ministerial statement, we don't really know was it expected or not. Yeah, um, the cash position is slightly complicated, um, if you bear with me. So, for the agriculture one, that was well known. We knew these farm payments were going out, and the forecast outturn would have shown a spike in September. Not saying that you should know something, but it would have shown a spike. For other things, um, budgets are done on a accrual basis. Um, that doesn't necessarily relate directly to the cash. So there is a risk that looking at the forecast outturn, you may not see those spikes. In terms of the cash management, we get monthly cash forecasts from, well, actually I actually think it's daily cash forecasts from departments, so they provide them in a month and give us their daily cash forecasts. Um, so that would show if something unexpected, well, if a department is planning to spend more cash, but they come in in such a way that it wouldn't be um, as easy to provide as the forecast outer, and they tend to come in with a, I think it's by the working day of the month, they give us their forecast, daily forecast for the following month. That is designed to inform the Treasury's cash management system. We draw down our funding from the Northern Ireland office through their block grant. Um, so we provide those, look at those forecasts for departments. We do a bit of a calculation ourselves on what cash we need, and that goes off to the NIO. In terms of departments, yes, the dear one would have been expected. We knew that they were due to make a big bulk of payments out for those farm payments in September, and we knew that if we hadn't had royal assent on the estimates and budget bill, which we weren't expecting, we would have to do in advance. Other times, the advances are for things that have sort of come out of the woodwork for departments as well. Um, I would be I'm not reluctant. There would be an awful lot of work involved if we were to provide you with the cash management figures that departments give us. And to be honest, I don't think they would be overly meaningful. We could undertake that where we were aware of an issue emerging to give you prior notice if that would be helpful. I think that, that would be useful, or whenever they do come through, perhaps for the, com the committee to have um, just even a note from yourself as to whether it was um, expected or not, because I just feel that whenever um, they come through in terms of a ministerial statement to the floor and they're shared with us, to make that more meaningful for us in terms of financial scrutiny, um, some sort of uh, mechanism by which um, a comment could be made, I feel would be very, very useful. Yeah, um, certainly if we're aware of anything, we'll give you prior notice and if timing permits, we could let you know, give you a note in advance. I'm saying if timing permits because sometimes, very occasionally, these are things that the department um, has not been aware of itself and they come to us very urgently and say, I, need a, you know, I, I quickly need a cash advance, in which case the things might have to happen in parallel. But where it is, the, like the dear, I want a more routine or we have a bit of advance notice in, yes, certainly. I, I think as well, if, if it is coming to you unexpectedly, you it would be good to bring that to our attention as well because yep. I think it's important for us to appreciate what you're dealing with yep. in terms of this in your department and how much notice that they actually get. I think it would, it would be good as well. Um, and in terms of um, any advances, um, are there any pending expected or were departments sitting that just currently? Um, I think if I can find the right way, I don't think there's any big ones expected. I think, um, just looking down, I think I did see something which said maybe um, if we didn't get royal assent by October, there may be an issue in education. Um, 
and I think there might have been something for the audit office. I, I can follow up on that in writing, I just can't find the note on it right now. Um, I suppose the other thing that's important to recognise is there's a limit on the amount that we can advance, um, and it's 2% of the previous year. Now, we still have $400 million left after the DERA one, but obviously if we didn't get... It's going to Royal, increase uh, with this new bill that we're about to push through. Yeah, yeah. Um, which brings us more in, the, in Westminster. They don't have a limit on their advances for contingencies, but, but we do. Um, and I think that's one of the, the reasons why we're always very concerned about budget bills and royal assent is because we know we have that limit. But yeah, look, we'll undertake. And if you want, obviously I'm only talking very rough, but if you want more briefing on the whole cash management process or want to meet with officials and that, we can get the right people up to talk to you if that would, if that would be helpful. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. Just um, as I say, just want to make sure that our scrutiny role is as effective as it can be and we're picking up on the issues and fully appreciate what you're dealing with there um, within your team. But thanks very much, Jerry. Okay, thanks, uh, Jerry Carroll. Jerry, if you're still with us. Can you hear us? Rolling no, West. Had some problems with the sound. And so, do you want to just go to Philip? Uh, yeah, I'll just go to Philip in the meantime, and then we'll come back to Jerry if we can. Philip, Brett. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for, for that. Uh, just one question on the city data. So, the meeting on Friday that you referenced, who represented the UK government at that? Who was it's there from the Northern Ireland office? There were two, I, I don't want to give them sure. two, two NIO officials, um, one of whom is the co-chair of the delivery board. No political figures? No political figures, no. Um, and it wasn't political representatives no, from the no, days, no. it yeah, was program sure. managers. So yeah, but the, yeah, the, it was the, the, the individual who co-chairs the delivery board with me. Uh, just in relation to the overspend projected at this stage, so 767, none of that's in the Department for Finance at this stage? No. Leading by example. We, we wouldn't allow the, the Department yeah. of Finance to, <laughs> to behave like that. Um, are you looking at any further revenue raising within the department in this financial year? Within the Department of Finance? Yeah. Um, not that I'm aware of. Obviously, I don't manage the DOF budget, but not that I'm aware of. And at this point in the year, I would say the capacity for further revenue raising by any department is, is going to be significantly limited. Um, just in relation to the budget sustainability and that urgent exercise and the um, the actions to address over commitments by the departments, what's your assessment of the uh, proposed actions by the departments that are detailed to this committee in Annex J? I don't think it uh, would be appropriate before the executives had its consideration for me to, to comment on the actions of individual departments. They have We have provided the information to you as they have provided it for us. Um, and I think you that can probably form its own opinion on the it? actions, but they have provided those, and departments are taking action where, where they can. So the view of the Department for Finance is that the department's returns to them are proposed actions, and you would define them as actions to... Well, not all of them would be actions, would be. Yeah. I think when, when you read them, it's clear that, that not all of them would be actions. They are explanations in some cases rather yes. than actions. Yeah, yeah, so if you just look at what, just pick one for example, so one of the biggest ones seems to be in the, um, the Department for Health. So in June they estimated their returns, it was 150 million uh, of pressures owing to pay awards. Uh, two months later that's 307 million. Um, would that be normal for a department to underestimate its overcommitments by... 100%. I, I think to be fair to the Department for Health, they were waiting on the outcome of pay review bodies and also the approach in England, and I think that's why we've seen that, that very significant jump in that figure. Um, if it hadn't been for that, then no, I wouldn't be expecting that level of change, but yes. I think it's those pay review body recommendations reporting and the approach that's been taken in, in England. Okay. Um, so will the executive now consider these proposed actions by departments? The executive is considering the in-year position on, its whole, on, on the whole, so there's a number of things for it to consider. I just think, and I'm sure members have, but I just think it would be useful that all members do familiarise themselves with the proposed actions by departments. It's clear that some departments have taken action and some others are simply you know, haven't proposed any actions to bring this spend under control. Uh, in relation to Barnet, so you know we constantly talk, we're expecting 500 million. Um, but a lot of that could be as a result of decision, policy decisions by the government, which then you know, this administration may wish to also act upon. So there's no 
guarantee that this 500 million is simply just for pressures. You know, the, the, there's still political decisions to be made in relation to those Barnett consequences. And I mean, there just seems to be a growing commentary that as a result of these Barnett consequentials that may be coming, that this is what it's going to be spent on. Um, but there will be political decisions. To well, there will all be, well, let's we'll start with, no, we, we don't have um, a breakdown of what those Barnett consequentials are. The, the 500 million or some 500 million figure we're using is based on discussions we're having with sure. Treasury on the likely direction of travel. It does absolutely depend on decisions taken on England. We do expect that a large element of that will be for health-related pressures, in particular the, the, those pay review body recommendations. Yes, absolutely, there are decisions to be taken by the executive, but what I would say is that the executive cannot overspend against its budgets. The consequences are dire, and therefore the, the decisions that will be that could be taken in relation to what that money could be spent on will be limited by the level of overcommitments in departments. Those will need to be managed down because if we were to overspend, the statement of fund policy is very clear that any overspend in one year comes off the subsequent year's budget. The Chief Secretary of the Treasury has explicitly said that if the Executive does not deliver a balanced budget this year, the 559 million reserve claim becomes repayable. Um, plus, we still have negotiations to take forward with the Treasury, particularly in relation not only to the 124 level of need, but also in 26-27 when we fall off a cliff edge, if the, when the financial package comes to an end. We had hard-won commitments in the interim fiscal framework about reviewing that and that we could plan need until our budget was set as part of the spend review. It needs to be reviewed before they set the budget for 26-27. If we overspend, that's going to jeopardise those negotiations. And that's why I just focus back to the annex that I did, because Reading that, you wouldn't seem to think that some departments are taking you know this as seriously as it is because it jeopardises the entire final you know agreement that's been made. So just to quote back to you, so the exercise that was undertaken and is now before us uh, was to focus minds. I think was the, the word in terms of permanent secretaries and, and well, ministers. it was it was to have an opportunity. So with the routine forecast out yeah. every month, it was to focus. I suppose to provide rather than rely on just on the forecast out-turn returns, which come in as a routine exercise, it was to provide an explicit exercise for departments to report to us so we could provide that information to the executive to allow the executive as a whole to consider the position and the finance minister, of course, to bring her recommendations forward. And do you have any assessment as to whether that has focused minds in some departments? I, I think the executive is still to consider and what I report back once that consideration has happened and uh, the Assembly has been updated in due course. Thank you very much, as always. OK, Nicola Brogan. Can we just try and go back to Jerry? Cox? Okay, we might. If, if that's okay, muted, Nicola, we might just go back to Jerry first. If you can, Jerry, can you? Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Go I ahead. Couldn't yeah. have before, but it seems to be okay now. Um, uh, thanks, John, and the uh, colleague for the presentation. Um, I asked the minister this week, um, but her view on um, a one percent tax increase in the one percent wealthiest and wealthiest in Britain, which would bring an extra twenty five billion pound. Um, she didn't say whether she raised that point with the Treasury last week, but she she made a, a comment. Um, she's always believed those with her broader shoulders should you know shoulder the burden. Um, which which I would obviously concur with. Was there any uh, proposals or ideas or points made to that effect by the minister or her team uh, with the Treasury last week? Um, I like. Can't comment on, on the entire detail of, of, of the meeting. Uh, I mean, the minister has spoken to herself and given her views there. Um, she did raise, the, raise very clearly and strongly the need for investment, public sector, and public sector workers. That was raised with the Treasury. Um, obviously, tax powers are not devolved, so we can make the case to Treasury, but we don't have any great influence over that. But as the minister, I think, has spoken for herself on that matter. Okay, I mean, I'm not asking you to kind of divulge any sort of secrets, so to speak, but was it was there any any proposals of any kind of that nature made? There, there was a, a wide discussion around a, raid, a range of issues, and it was very clearly the point was very made made that this budget is an opportunity to invest in public sector, public sector services, and public sector workers. That that point was was made very strongly. Okay, thank you. So I think I know to me, but appreciate the answer. Thank you. Well, of course, yeah, we we will see. The minister may may choose to seek the uh, the the devolution of of these of those powers, and obviously that could be part of the fiscal framework negotiations. We'll see. Uh, Nicola Brogan. Nicola. Thank you. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, Joanne and Jeff, for your update here this evening and for outlining, I suppose, how um, the announcement about the city deals um, did proceed last week, and obviously, as everyone else said, it has been symbolic and. Um, 
I suppose an area of great frustration for anyone involved in it. Um, I've said from the outset here at today's meeting that I'm um, obviously I represent a region that's involved with the Mid South West um deal, and it's a great concern for, to all of us locally that this has been paused. And uh, as Keeve Archibald outlined in her um, written statement to the Assembly as well, you know, um, the, these the, the two deals that have been paused um, represent rural areas and it does feel like the rural areas are being targeted again in this case by the British government um, so it is a matter of huge frustration and you'll know yourself Joanne better than me probably about the time and effort and investment and commitment that people put in um, to these deals and now that there is this pause there will be a, a huge level of uncertainty and nervousness around it and going the people involved in it will be wondering um if they should still be, you know. So it is very concerning. Um and I'm glad that the committee did agree to um you know write to the Secretary of State and relay these here concerns. Um my question to you is um about what kind of communication or discussions the Department of Ministers had um about the two pause deals. Um in recent days, I know that um, obviously the other two um, deals have been progressed, which is very, very welcome. In, in fact, Straban is part of my constituency as well. So it's, it's fantastic news for, the, for that area. Um, but since that, that announcement and those have been progressed, can you go into any sure. detail into what kind of communications has been on the two pause deals since? Yes, um, the Minister met with the Council Chief Executives from the two pause deals on Monday morning um, and then she met them again yesterday to provide an update after her meeting um, with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and the Secretary of State. Um, the Minister, after having met with the deals on the Monday morning, she was able to convey directly the feelings of those deals to the Secretary of State and the uh, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and during the meeting with the deals to provide them with an update yesterday she made it clear um, that she's continuing to support them and would be pressing for the unpausing of the deals. She made that very strongly clear to both the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and the, the Secretary of State and, and has subsequently uh, made the statement to the Assembly today and there was a party leader letter which issued yesterday. So very strong in her support for those deals um, as I think we all are and all of the support is very welcome. Um, and needless to say, I mean, those deals, the approach that has been taken has caused them confusion and uncertainty. They have a lot of questions and we'll be trying to get them answers for those questions. Absolutely. OK, thank you for that, Joanne. And um, what engagement has the Department of Minister had with deal partners? Um, and like, what has their reaction been to this here outside of... Uh, <coughs> Yeah, I mean, the deal partners, um, as I said, confusion and uncertainty. Um, they have conveyed their concerns that this decision could risk private sector confidence. That's something we would agree with. This sort of uncertainty is not helpful when you're trying to lever in that private sector confidence. Um, Cosby Coast and Glensmith Southwest have also said that they feel, and I think you referred to this, that the approach adopted by the UK government is, has created a two-tier approach. That is something that we have also made clear to them. Um, now, the, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury did say it's because of the stage the deals are at. Um, it may be an unfortunate consequence, but it is a consequence nonetheless that the two city deals are going ahead, whereas the two more rural growth deals yeah. are not. Um, the Belfast Region City deal and the Darien Strand deal have been united in their solidarity with the two growth deals. And I think that both um, Belfast issued a public statement, and I think uh, Derry actually covered it at their uh, deal signing event today. So it's good that we have that strong working relationship with the deals and that. Um, they recognise, as we all do, that we need all four deals for Northern Ireland. It's not enough to just have the two. Well, I think that's it. The four are interlinked in, in some kind yes. of sense, aren't they? They'll promote economic growth right across the north, not just in the, the separate areas. No, I appreciate that. And you're right, Owen made that point earlier in the meeting as well about the private sector investment. It, it, um, it can put that in jeopardy as well. So thank you for that. I have one more question, just um, relating more to the budgets. And that's about, we've talked a heap of times here before about multi-year budgets. And I know it was been put on hold until the spending review. So um, in your opinion, is there any likelihood of a multi-year budget beyond the spend review or has that been scoped out or has there been any discussions about it? Um, the approach taken by the Treasury to their spend review is fortunately going to, to limit our ability. We can only set a budget for when we have a spending envelope in place. So the Chancellor is going to announce a one-year, the first stage of the spend review on the 30th of October, which will be a one-year funding settlement for 25-26. Um, that means we will have to do a one-year budget for 25-26. Going forward, the Chancellor did commit to multi-year budgets, and in the spring we'll announce budget for 26, 27, 27, 28. 
Finance Minister has made very clear her commitment to multi-year budgets and we would expect that to be done. As part of Jeff's work on the Budget Sustainability Plan, one of, one of the, the next stages of that is to look at that sort of <coughs> budget improvement and how we do that going forward. But Finance Minister is very clearly committed to multi-year budgets and when we can, we will do so. Okay. That's great, Joanne. Thank you. Thank okay, you, Nicola, Chair. Um, next is Owen Tennyson. Thank you, um, Chair. And just returning to the City Deal issue, Joanne. Following the Minister's engagement with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, is there any certainty that we won't see another pause in the spring um, in that spending review, or is that still entirely unclear? The assurances that the Minister has received is that the two deals, um, the two city deals, the Belfast and the Darien Strabane district deals, can go ahead. They are at the stage where the funding has been committed and they can go ahead. She has received that assurance. Um, what we don't have the assurances on is at the point at which we will know about the growth deals. We are pushing for an lift, immediate lift on the pause, um, feeling that we'd hope to get an answer in October, but we haven't got any certainty in that at all. And we don't know whether decisions are going to go any wider. Okay, okay so we're, we're hoping for October, but we're not actually confident that that's when we will we're get not, not sure. I, ha- I haven't seen anything that sets that out in, in writing, and you'll appreciate I got to the stage where I like to see things in writing. I imagine. Yeah, no, that, that's useful. Thank you. Um, turning then just to the overcommitment, in terms of the process of um, departments presenting their overcommitments, what is the guidance that the Department of Finance gives to those departments? So is it a bit like when you're setting the budget where you say sort of don't present pay as a pressure if you can, or how, how does that work? Um, we set it out in the forecast out turn guidance initially, which was we recognise the pressures in departments. There's a requirement for you to live within your budget, therefore your overall forecast to us must come in on budget. But you can represent, if you, if you have an overcommitment because you're hoping to take decisions later in the year, you can reflect that and we want to see that because we want to see what those issues are. We didn't set specifics on what they could or couldn't include in that forecast overcommitment. That is their view and what their decisions are. The majority of them, I think, did include pay costs in that. Some of them have said the pay costs are funded in some instances and it's other things that are leading to the overcommitment. But as you know, technically, it's, if it's a non-contractual pay award, it isn't committed expenditure. It's discretionary. Now, we wouldn't want to see the instance where public sector don't get paid. but So we captured those funded and non-funded pay costs as part of this exercise. And is what's presented to us here, I mean, is that the sum total of the actions that have been forthcoming from the departments? That is, that is you have got the returns that the departments have sent to us as part of their forecast outturn. Um, there may be detail in different areas coming forward as part of the, the in-year exercise, but I would imagine the two should, should be the, the same, if not very similar. Okay. And what would the process be, I mean, if, if we're getting closer towards the end of the financial year and there are still significant overcommitments and there's a risk of overspend, I mean, <coughs> what, what ability does the Finance Minister actually have to intervene and direct? Very little for direct intervention. I mean, it does come down to departmental ministers taking decisions. The budget is agreed as the in-year monitoring allocations are agreed by the executive and each minister should abide by the decisions of the executive. That is in the ministerial code. But when it comes down to actual penalties that can be applied, uh, previous years, um, the Department of Finance would have said if any department overspends one year, we will immediately deduct it from your budget next year, given the level of some of those pressures. I don't know how realistic that is. Um, there will be legal limits on their spending when the budget bill goes through. Um, there will be limits on the cash they can actually physically draw down from the consolidated fund, which depends on that budget bill. Um, equally, the cash that the DOF can access to pay to departments is limited by what goes through the Northern Ireland Office's estimates. So there are potential issues there, but in terms of penalties, very little that the Finance Minister can do to control individual departmental spending. Okay. And look, I understand if you don't want to go into individual departments, and I accept that, but are there any departments which, from the Department of Finance's perspective, um, are facing disproportionate overspend? Um, it's very hard without going into the specifics of it. I mean, the largest pressures, as we said, are in health, education and justice. There are arguments from departments over the, you know, how those pressures have arisen and what decisions they are taking. I think it's clear that there are pressures across the board in departments. Um, uh, some departments may be taking tougher decisions than others are. Um, others may be limited in what they can do. It's a di- very difficult position, and that's why it's important that it's uh, considered by the executive as a whole and in the round. 
No, that, that's helpful, John. Thank you. Uh, no further questions, um, Jared. But I guess again, just a comment to say that, I mean, my reading of these figures is that I know Philip highlighted the Department of Health and it's it's concerning. Um, but we know the Department of Health is in financial difficulty. The Department for Education actually seems to have a disproportionate overcommitment for its resource budget. Um, and I know there have been decisions in, in recent weeks um, with additional discretionary spend yeah. um, being agreed. And whilst it's relatively small amounts of money, I can't get straight in my mind how that can be the position of the Minister. Um, so I'm concerned, actually, um, at the level of overcommitment that we're seeing before us. And I think the Department of Education or all departments? Specifically in the Department for Education, because again, in, in health, we know there are challenges in terms of the budget, and the Minister's been making that clear. Um, in justice, there has been a, a wide range of conversation um, about underfunding. And the actions, um, in fairness, are more comprehensive and explanatory on the Department of Health and Justice in terms of what um, the, the reasons are and the overcommitments are. But I, I, I have a specific concern about the Department for Education. Um, and I, I think we need to keep a close eye on this overspend as a committee without being too political about it because it has potential dire consequences for our public finances if ministers do overspend at the end of this financial year. Okay. Steve Aiken. Dr. Aiken, can you hear us? Or more importantly, can we hear you? Seems to be a microphone sign. I did press it. Eve? um, No, no, it went again. Just while we're waiting on Steve, Steve, um, I I just have a couple of uh, brief ones before we release you. Um, on the question of um, the multi-year budget, and obviously we all want to see a multi-year budget, um, and in many ways that is the key to unlocking many of the things that are in the programme for government and the aspiration to doing long-term things, whether that's transforming the health service or really basically everything, all of the long-term challenges that have built up or that we haven't addressed. Is there any... Um, argument to or is there a means or a, a, um, uh, an opportunity even if you don't have and you won't have obviously because the UK government told you that you're not going to a multi-year um, a horizon to from the UK government you're not going to have a multi, they're not doing a CSR this October to give you until 2027 or whatever and um, can you kind of do one yourself now I, 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 your first reaction will be don't be crazy that we this is a devolved that we get them but you can you up to a point say well we would estimate that we are and, and start to kind of set multi can you is there a way of setting multi-year indicative budgets even if you don't have full certainty from the uk government in order to say to could you prioritize could perhaps prior match to program government priorities could you say we are going to make the commitment now that we will give you a multi-year indicative budget for for example getting waiting times down, or a multi-year indicative budget for special educational needs, and we are going to take a degree of risk, because we don't, we obviously can't know exactly what the UK government's going to offer us, but we want to get these multi-year budgets in place to start working on them. Why not do that? I suppose, start, and Jeff will want to come in here, because I could, I could see him edging <laughs> towards <Yes>. my... <laughs> uh, yeah. um, I suppose to start with, you're absolutely... We cannot legally, yeah. publicly announce a budget that goes beyond the spent review period. Right. Can more be done in terms of long-term planning? Yes, and Jeff will say more mm-hmm. of that because part of the, the strand that once he gets the first hurdle over of getting a budget sustainability plan published, there's yeah. a, a long work programme for his very small team in that respect. And Jeff, you might want to say more than that. But I think the other thing is that departments can also have multi-year plans. There is nothing to stop departments. And in fact, I would expect departments to be setting out their multi-year plans um, in doing that. But Jeff, do you want to say something more about sort of where we're going or where we're intending to go, subject, of course, to political agreement. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, um, you know, it's all subject to the executive agreeing um, the budget sustainability plan. But um, as part of that, we would envisage that there would be a forward work program um, so that the plan itself, um, unfortunately, wouldn't solve all our problems, but it would be a starting position for us in terms of putting a platform in place um, to launch into slightly more ambitious, executive-driven um, piece of work that helps us with a common goal of financial sustainability. So um, we would be looking at um, longer-term, say, five-year departmental um, 
uh, strategic plans going Great. forward, uh, and that would look at all sorts of things that the departments are doing. So we look at what the department wants to do, what they're legislatively obliged to do, um, you know, what their demand is going to be, what their cost control is going to be, what an indicative budget might look like for them, okay. and it allows them then to say if they got that. Here is, the, here is the things that we could do, here are the things that we could do if we got a little bit more, here's the things that we might have to cut if we got a little bit less. So that would be kind of in our forward work pl- okay. plan. Good. Um, that's useful to know. And I presume that will be tied into the programme for government because one of the things we obviously yeah. want to see is that the programme for government is... Uh, is there going to be, when the programme for government is published, is there any plans to have a, a kind of uh, a document or even a couple of sides of A4 which explain how budget lines are going to match to the programme for government priorities. So in, in those kind of <clears throat> four work plans, one of the, the kind of headings, and it's, it's a rough working one at the minute, is that sort of direction, and that'll yeah. include programme for government. What are your commitments to the programme for government, um, inclu- along with what are your um, yeah. you know, strategic commitments, so on and so forth. Um, but also we're, we're, we're looking to do a budget improvement plan alongside that, yeah. um, potentially, and if, if we got to go ahead for that. That would include how do we link our programme for government with our budget and um, what would that look like, how do we do that going forward and um, how do we link it with things like climate action as well and, and all the sort of longer term strategic things that we want to do uh, as a government. So uh, th- that programme of work will be in place now. It may look very, you know, it's an iterative process because I don't think we'd get it right the first time round. Yeah. But um, I think we could start to link that um, uh, in the next spending review to say here's roughly um, some of the, the key links between what, what we're doing in budget and what programme for government are doing and then start to kind of build on that and uh, you know, um, make that sort of more comprehensive as we go on. One final question for me, then I'll turn it over to the Deputy Chair, here's, here's another one. Um, we're expecting a budget in Dublin in um, November time. Now, obviously, that's not a budget you have responsibility for. I'm not asking you to answer for... Uh, you can have to answer for London, you don't have to answer for Dublin as well. Um, well it's something we don't know. Today, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we want to ask you about the finished budget. Um, but uh, obviously we know about the Shared Island Fund uh, have, there, have you had any internal conversations about uh, so for example we're expecting we, we, we're, not, we're not expecting we're definitely going to get this autumn uh, an updated budget as we have discussed in this committee <laughs> one or two people have noticed that a certain uh, technology company is going to be trans- sending a bob or two to the um, re- uh, re- revenue commissioners um, have there been any internal discussions about how you, potential outreach to the Irish government about the shared island fund and priority setting? It doesn't fall specifically to my area, but yes, those conversations are ongoing and Minister meets with her counterparts in the in the Irish government. Okay. Uh, Diane? Yeah, thanks for letting me back in, Chair. I just wanted to build on points raised by Philip and Owen and just to clarify in terms of process, Joanne, um, my understanding and I just want um, to hear from yourself is that if you believe in your department that there are um, departments that are not taking action to try to do their best to bring themselves within budget, you would be bringing that to the executive? Or you would bring it to your minister to bring to the executive? We have, we have brought the entire position to the executive to consider, and that includes all, all departments. So we're not singling out any one department or giving a view on them. We are bringing the information to the executive to take a decision. As, as I, I said in, in response um, to Owen, the finance minister has no control really over the spending of other departments. The executive sets the budget, a minister should live within the budget set by the executive. If a minister decides not to do so, then it has dire consequences for the executive's budget as a whole. But unfortunately, we have very little, if any, control over that. So we can ask for the information, we can bring it to the executive, the executive can make its own decisions on that. But the finance minister herself has limited control over departmental spending. Would you report, so Philip um, had brought up the point of um, how it appeared in the reading of it that some departments uh, you know, were, were taking more action and more steps than others. Um, if you or the Finance Minister were to believe that some departments weren't taking enough action to try to get back within budget, would that be something that you would be bringing to the Executive? Not necessarily views on individual departments. We, we do have ongoing engagement with departments and we will raise that. So yes, we will identify issues. Every, every minister will make the case for their own budget. But to point to the area of discretionary spend, no department should be incurring discretionary spend while it's forecasting an overcommitment. There is a responsibility, not only on the ministers, but on their accounting officers to live within the budget that has been set by the executive. And discretionary spend while you're forecasting an overcommitment is quite frankly unacceptable. 
thanks very much. And in terms of um, other committees, would they be engaging directly with you where they felt there was particular concerns? or We have, sorry, we have, we have no engagement at this point with other committees. Um, I would expect them to be very strongly scrutinising the actions of their own departments. And I mean, each minister will make a very strong case for their own department, there's no doubt about that, and will, I'm sure, be able to defend their yeah. okay. actions. Okay. Uh, if no other members wish to come in at this point, we're, we're going to move off this section. One, um, uh, one request I was going to make, we do now have a brief, we now have touched on it already and um, it, it's, it's been raised, but we are due to technically discuss the, uh, the outturn data that's been helpfully provided to us. So if Joanne was able to pause to see if any other members had additional questions about that, release Jeff. But before you go, Jeff, sorry, just one more thing, um, as Glumbo would say, um, budget sustainability plan, we expect that is going to be it has to be signed. It's going to be signed off or discussed by the executive at the end of September. And um, it would be helpful if we could get early sight of that once it is and as early as possible, a kind of immediate readout if possible at the committee. And obviously, a, a, we, we really appreciate an oral briefing from yourself. Um, uh, I did the minister, of course, is always welcome to come and brief us too. Chair, we we have the closed session um, on the twenty fifth next week, and I understand it'll be discussed at the executive the following day. So. What you can tell us on the 25th may not be what comes out of the executive. So if there was an immediate readout from the executive, and if then you would be available to come and brief on that, because we appreciate that will obviously tie in with publication, um, and it would be a case of then the, the committee could talk about that in open session, because publication would have happened, if that's doable yes. for you. As soon as the executive agreed, we can have a copy of the plan with you with a, a brief. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. And um, now, thank you, Jeff. Now, members, we're just going to briefly go through because we have, have it as a specific agenda item. Um, uh, it's at page one five seven of the meeting packet. It's the forecast outturn data for June, July. Um, it was already raised, um, particularly Philip Brett, who's no longer with us. But um, uh, obviously, um, it's very useful and it's a useful table. And I'm glad that we've discussed it, particularly the deputy chair who had asked for it. We are, this is now going to be a monthly item on our agenda. The one we have covers June and July um, uh, ex forecast and outturn expenditure um, and uh, the categories reported against are non-resource, sorry, non-ring fenced resource Dale, ring fenced, ring fenced Dale, capital Dale and ring fenced financial transactions capital. Um, uh, detailed figures begin at page 34 of the table pack and they run for many pages but the tables are actually relatively straightforward to read um, and even though we're all, with the exception of some of us, humble politicians, if you if we can't if you can't read and make sense of those tables, you really shouldn't be on this committee because it's it's very useful and very straightforward, uh, and it does have very um, obviously, for example, there are significant variances as was pointed out um, uh, with the, the the Department of uh, 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 the Department of Education and its um, and its um, and its ring fenced Dell, um, so. If there's anything particularly um, members wish to raise now about that that we haven't already raised, um, and ask any other questions of Joanne. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to say yeah. I appreciate um, this in this format. I think it's really, really helpful and useful and just mm -hmm. draws your eye to the exact situation and allows you to ask questions that need to ask. We just want to say thanks for that. Yeah, I'll, I'll feed back to that back to the team because they work very hard on the, the forecast sector with very short turnaround times to get it to Treasury, I have to say. So no, I appreciate I'll pass it. that on sure to them. Yeah, I thought so. Find it the useful and, and, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's helpful and I think allows us to, to and I think will allow us to, to, to do more of, to do our job more straightforwardly. Um, so members, there's a few specific just asks I need to run through. Um, uh, um, if members are agreed, we might just ask the, the department for more detail. We can obviously ask more detail as and when we like, but um, around uh, the um, the policy change regarding student loans, because we're going to see a further reduction in student loan. Yeah. RDL, obviously, this is always a question people ask because it pops up as this big number, but it's kind of a not a made-up number, but it's a hypothetical. It, it relates to basically the volume of student loans. It's essentially a product of loans being bigger in England because yeah. fees are higher. It is, and I think we did provide a separate mm. briefing paper on it, um, but look, happy to revisit that if it doesn't answer the questions. Um, it may be one, obviously we deal with the finance of student loans and the reporting of it, but the actual running of it is Department for Economy, so it may be one yes. where if we're failing to explain anything properly that we get Department for Economy. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, and we will uh, we'll we'll write to uh, other departments with the forecast our turn. And I think strongly suggest that, uh, as per Owen Tennyson's comments earlier, when we ask them to look at their own department's figures and reflect on that, because they all obviously have responsibility to scrutinise their department spending habits. It's not just on us. If any other comments or questions for Joanne at this stage? If not, thank you, Joanne. And we will, there will obviously be other follow-up actions coming from that, and we will speak to you again soon. Thank members, you. thank you, uh, Joanne. So, members, the next agenda item is correspondence, which starts at page 167 of the meeting pack. There are five items of correspondence, which I will endeavour to get through relatively quickly. Um, um, the first one is 10.1, uh, is NISRA, from NISRA, and it relates to sickness absence in the civil service. NISRA has published sickness absence figures for NICS for 23-24. The executive summary has been provided, which outlines the main headlines from the report. Key facts also provide a picture of how things have changed from 1920. The headline absence figure was 13.8 days on average, up from 12.3 days in 22-23, with an estimated increase in, with an estimated increase in direct salary costs of 5 million. The portion of staff with no sick absence in 23-24 was 56.9 percent, down from 57.8 percent. However, this is an improvement on the last pre-COVID and hybrid working figure of 50.7 percent. The proportion of sick absence days due to long-term sickness is 82 percent, um, while the proportion of staff absent with long-term sickness is 14 percent of those absence with sickness. So just to explain those figures, what that means is um, of those numbers, so the average if you took out the people who have long-term sickness, the average the average among people who do not have who are not on long-term sick leave, the average annual days of sick leave is a lot lower. Looking at the 13.8 days on average, it might make you think, "My gosh, that seems like a very unhealthy workforce." If the average staff member is taking nearly 14 days off a year, but that average includes people who have long-term sick leave who are dealing with chronic or, in some cases, terminal conditions. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. That's, um, uh, the, the, the high level of long-term sick absence, absence tends to skew the overall figure, um, uh, and obviously we have a higher age profile uh, in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, uh, which is another thing we may want to come back to because it's a, frankly, quite a significant structural challenge for the civil service here, particularly when we have official, we, we, official stick rel or we have a, both an older age profile and the tendency to retire earlier here, which is a bit of a huge structural challenge that we're facing and we see the consequences of it sometimes in front of our committee um, uh, in terms of able people retiring. Um, the average number of sick days per head was 0 0.49. The average number of sick days per head in, in NICS was 0 0.49 for 23-24, down from... Um, 0.52 in 22-23. This compares to um, 0.64 in uh, 1920. That makes sense to people. I don't entirely Just understand the difference between what so that, how that. The, the big figure different from the is the average taken among. So the the, the the high figure of number of days is the average of of sickness as a whole divided by the the number of people who have been sick. But if you take that figure and you extrapolate it across everybody in the NSCS, ah. it goes down dramatically to basically half a day of sickness per person in the N in the NICS. I think I that's think not, not, not always percent. clear in the in the figures. The figures are average sick absence for people who have been sick, okay. not for every single person. I did not explain I did not explain that well so I'm glad you gave it. No, no, it's fine. Because it's it's just those figures, the way they're presented can be very confusing. And as you highlighted, Chair, the, the significant proportion, eighty two percent of that sickness is from people who are on long term sickness. So if you take that out, again the sickness level falls. So that tends to skew it quite a bit. I know okay. here so the, we average have the average number, the average, the average civil servant had half a day off. Effectively, half a day. I think that's a bit more. Uh, it's not a figure that usually gets the headlines, chair. The other figure tends to get more of a headline. Uh, so we considered it. Next. So I mean, I think this is something for us to, uh, as an ongoing kind of our job in terms of scrutinising. I would make a suggestion, which is I think it would be helpful for us to get a comparator with neighbouring jurisdictions, both mm. the UK. So I don't know if it's published at you because we're the only devolved civil service, fully devolved civil yeah. service. The Scottish government is based part of the home UK civil service. But I would, I would if we could find comparable figures for um, yeah. the UK and actually the Republic as well, 
do any members wish to come in? Diane. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And um, I was a bit surprised that when this was released, it got so little attention. I think there's just been so much going on in the news, and I think that it is very serious, and I would ask that we um, consider looking at it um, quite seriously um, sooner rather than later. Whenever you dig into the details, that's £44 million pounds sicknessly cost in direct salary costs last year. And the reason why it would just, um, you know, it noticed, I noticed it so significantly was it's the exact amount of money that Gordon Lyon says that it would cost to run winter field payments so that there is a direct comparator and that's direct salary costs. I also put a couple of questions into the Minister on the back of it so yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's a bigger picture here. There's the direct salary costs, there's the cost of um, any temporary staff, agency workers are acting up that have had to um, come into play uh, to cover the sickness absence, and also to reflect on last week the fact that you know it's being declared that with 3,200 vacant posts within the civil service, so I think there's an entire picture here um, just off staff, and and we need to look at it. And again, as you say, to say 82% of of these figures are on long-term sick, I think you know it, it would be the wider perception that people are they tending to take longer periods when they do take them? Um, and that would be something I would like to see compared um, to other areas. And um, you know, how many people are coming back after long-term sick or uh, to work, or how many are going on to, to retire? I do think this is just so significant. Um, I was just so surprised that it didn't even hit headlines that it had gone up even um, a day and a half since the, the year before um, and when it came out. You know, I was just quite struck by it, and I think that as a committee, we need to be being quite proactive in terms of. Sure, I think we should definitely. Uh, we can probably. We are due at some point a, a dedicated meeting with Jill Min on, on some of these things. So we can probably. Uh, I'm an electrician by trade, so I don't feel qualified to talk about sick pay. Chair, I know that individual organisations do produce figures on a fairly granular level. I know we do in the Assembly. I would assume it's exactly the same with the Department. So everything the Deputy Chair has, has kind of outlined, mm. that kind of data should be available and we'll we'll go away and see what else we can we can okay. get in terms of that plus as you say the comparators. And Chair, it was just when I asked the Minister about what action had happened since this was reported, um, for it to have gone up in one year from twelve point three days to thirteen point eight days. You know, there, there's not an action plan in her response. It was there is a health and wellbeing framework in the civil service, and I just feel that there, with the rate at which it's increasing, I feel like um, we should be asking: Is there not a more um, focused action plan? I think, it may, but but it might be help be helpful for us. So if it's up from if like we don't know, thirteen point eight days may be, uh, and I don't know, I'm not like rela bit relaxed or dismissive about it at all because it does seem high. It is high clearly. Um, but it may be there's a relatively high variance, so it could be 13.8 days, one year, 12.3 days the year before, 15 days before. You know what I mean? There might be high that it could, for example, be a product of people if, if it is people who are who have chronic or in some cases you know terminal conditions. That way. but I think we can get we, we should get all those statistics and have a further discussion about it. Um, and recently, 2020, 2021 was only 9.8. Yeah. So it's rose the last two the two years after that was twelve point two, twelve point three, and then it's thirteen point eight. It's yeah. quite a sharp rise, you know. Okay. Um if anybody else wants to come in? We in that case we will uh, we will sort those things and come mm -hmm. back to it. Um the next thing is the department's the, the financial reporting advisory board, the twenty three twenty four annual report, members of page two six of the pack you will find the 23-24 annual report for the Financial Reporting Advisory Board. This is to note, unless anybody wishes to make any comment. Uh, item 10.3 is a report from Pivotal in the first seven months of the restored Northern Ireland Executive. That is published at page 235 of the meeting pack. So that's to note, unless anybody member wishes to make a comment. 10.4 is the NI Audit Office Departmental Guide. Members, there's a, a guide to the Department of Finance published by the NI Audit Office. The NIAO has published an overview of its programme of audit work and recently published reports relevant to the Department Committee. And it's quite useful, So, um, it's, but it's to note, um, and obviously for people to have a look at it, if it's useful, it is at page, ten, um, it's at page 251. Unless anybody should raise a comment. The next is the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules, the 22nd report, there are no rules referenced which are relevant to us. Agenda item 11 is the draft forward work programme, which is not much changed from the last time, but the clerk is going to talk to it. 
Chair, just while we've been uh, meeting this afternoon, we've managed to ascertain that we can get this room early next week and the week after, because we have a couple of urgent briefings we're looking to slot in. So if members are in agreement to start at 1pm next week and the week after that, and we'll slot those in, we're, we're basically talking pretty much live to the Dallow about what we can get done in those next couple of weeks. So that would be <coughs> programme for government and... Um, City deals, city, city and region growth deals. And the uh, Interim Transformation Board. Yeah, the and we are also yeah. working on our 9th of October financial services yes. thing, so, and we're hopefully going to try and get FSU, I think, for the yeah. 9th. We, yeah. We're going to try and get them in for that, Dave. That's probably going to be, I think a lot of those briefings are probably going to be by Zoom, so we'll be crossing yeah. our fingers. Well, I think that's fine, and I think that's fine because a lot of that is research, and I think, as I said, to the, um, to the I think there's a particular... Um, opportunity for us to, um, in addition to all the, obviously the scrutiny work around spending and budget sustainability and multi year budgets and all of our budget scrutiny work and the core part of the rule, I do think there's a real opportunity and a necessity for us to really um, make some progress in financial services because I, it's come up so often, the minister's looking at it. Um, and so I think if, if members are content, we'll, we will continue to try and uh, look for opportunities to, to investigate that and to um, and to get a grip, I think, really, about where we think financial services are here and what's, what is and isn't happening, how it is and isn't supporting, you know, not consumers, workers, the economy, I think, more generally, because I think, uh, I, I don't think there's enough attention, bluntly, in, in terms of financial services in Northern Ireland. I think it's just, it's slightly fallen through the cracks, so I think it's a, an important bit of work for us to do. Okay. If members are content and there wasn't any other comment to make on the Ford Work Programme, it'll be published on the committee webpage. <coughs> Agenda item 12, any other business? Sure, can I raise uh, an item of, of AOB? It's just actually following up um, on our evidence session with Joanne. Um, you had referenced actions in terms of writing to other committees around the forecast um, overspend. Mm -hmm. Can I suggest that we also write to the Minister to ask for her assessment of the actions that departments have proposed? Because whilst it's not under her direct control, she does have influence. Um, and I think it would be a fair question for us to ask in terms of whether she's satisfied that all departments are doing all that they can. Um, because it's not like a, it's not like normal years, of, as we've rehearsed, um, the consequences to this are really significant. So I think it's worth asking the question if the committee's agreed. It, uh, but, um, instinctively, I would agree to that. But do you mean what, what she's doing to ensure that other people live within their... A lot of budgets. I think her, her assessment of the actions that have been proposed to address over commitments by other departments, and then yes, secondly, what action is she is she taking off the back of that? I'm content with that. If others are, okay, we will get that letter off, uh, and we've agreed our other actions for um, for next week. Okay, if everyone's content, we will uh, adjourn. The committee is now adjourned. Committee Room 21, sign.